This is March 8th, 2019. We're in Lexington, Massachusetts. And this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Jim Ramsey. Our camera person is Maureen Sullivan, and we're very privileged to have with us today Winston Emery Flynn, who goes by the name of Pat. So welcome, Pat. <laughs> My pleasure. Good to have you with us. Uh, may I ask when you were born? 1924, 7th of September. And where were you born? West Lebanon, New Hampshire. West Lebanon, New Hampshire. And basically, uh, you grew up in New England, I guess, generally. Yes, mostly White River Junction, White Vermont. River Junction, Vermont. Right. Right, right. And what is your marital status? Married. You're married. What's your wife's name? Edith Flynn. And how long have you lived in Lexington, your present home? We're, we're, we're at your home here today. Well, we came here in 1973, and we've been here ever since. So, Same house. Great. Great. Okay, so where, where and when did you enter the military? 1943 in Greenfield, Mass. In Greenfield. Is that, that's where you signed up? That's where I... Yes. Why did you join uh, at that time? Well, I knew I was going to be drafted because I had to sign up for the, the, uh, the draft. So I volunteered to, because I saw a note in the paper they wanted ski, skiers for the 10th Mountain Division in Colorado. So I volunteered for it. The 10th Mountain Division? Yeah. I've, I've heard of that. Uh, <laughs> so you've, you volunteered with that in mind? Yeah, in mind is correct. <laughs> okay. So let's see, that's the Army, right? Right. So therefore you joined the Army? I joined the Army. In the hopes of going direct to the 10th Mountain Division? Well, I didn't go direct. I had to go through basic no, training know, and stuff that, like that. But that was your objective? Right. Okay. Uh, and why did you want to go to the 10th Mountain Division? Because I like to ski and it sounds exciting. You like to ski and it was and exciting? I like to ski and I, I like the mountains. That's great. Uh, did family or friends join the service when you did? Anybody else or were you kind of, you just joined yourself? I just joined myself. Where did you go for basic training? Uh, Alabama. Alabama. Right. What was basic training like? It was a an eye opener because there were so many troops coming in or recruits, and uh, the way we lived, like you go to the bathroom, and then you got seats here about twenty on each side of the room. And nothing in between, and uh, you could be sat down with about with another twenty-five or thirty people doing the same thing. <laughs> you take a shower; the shower would hold about forty-five people, and because we had uh, very, very many people at that uh, basic training. I mean, must. Right, this was a huge recruiting uh, period. Or, to me, that was uh, an eye opener because I'd never been, never saw anything like it. So, what did you, did did you like anything about basic training? No. <laughs> uh, did you dislike anything about basic training? No, I I just accepted it, what they were doing to me. And this was what, a, like a six week period or it was something? eight weeks? Eight weeks of basic. Yeah. So. Did you receive any training beyond basic, or, did no, we, you, or were you sent off at that time? We had basic training, and then we had about two weeks in, a, in, a, in another subject, and then we were shipped out to uh, uh, Virginia to get on board a ship. So basically, essentially after basic, you, were, you, you went off to join the fight. Right. Uh, so what, when you left basic, uh, what was your rank? Private. You were private. Right. 
and you went to Virginia to get on board a ship. Get on board a ship bound for where? Well, we didn't know at the time until we got there, actually. Uh, oh, well, wait, I'm sorry to interrupt. What about the 10th Mountain Division? Uh, that's a story by itself, but I'll be brief. Uh, I had the papers for it, and uh, I went in and saw uh, the first sergeant. His name was Val Forney. And uh, I told him, I said, all these papers, uh, you got to send me to Camp Hill, Colorado for ski training. Next thing I do, I found I was out sitting in the grass, and he was standing over me. And he was very much of a gentleman. He said, now, son, he said, you're in the Army. He said, you never tell me what you're going to do. I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. <laughs> and that's when I found myself on board the ship later. So he basically knocked you on your butt after you uh, presumed to? Yeah, uh, I, I never got there. I see. Well, uh, so much for skiing. <laughs> so much for skiing. But, but there was a, a catch to that. When I was in Italy, the 10th Mountain Division came over for combat duty. And I watched them when they got off board the ship. But, uh, so that, that was as close as you got? Yeah, as close as I got it. So you got on board ship and you went where? We went to, they said we were in the biggest convoy that ever left uh, Virginia in that area to go to North Africa. North Africa. And uh, we spent about maybe 35, 38 days on board ship. Just getting... Just getting there. We thought we were never going to get there. So what was shipboard life like, by the way? That was just a mess. A ship packed it, with it soldiers. It was just packed with people, and you had two meals a day. You had to get in two? line for it. And uh, you had to get in line to go to the bathroom, get in line to get cleaned up. And uh, it was just too many people. And, the weather was good, so a lot of us slept on the deck. And uh, my favorite place on the deck was the lifeboats. So, Sleeping in a lifeboat? Yeah, that, there was a whole lot of us in a lifeboat. We sleep yeah. outdoors. I see. So yeah. did you ever have any seasickness problems? or? No, that, that never bothered me. Good, good. So you spent 38 days uh, on the water, and then you arrived where? We, we went through the streets of Gibraltar, and uh, they took our ship there. Our ship was in the middle of the convoy, and we went through the streets of Gibraltar, and after we got through there, the convoy, they took our ship and they moved it back to the uh, right rear of the convoy, on the, on the, right on the edge. So I... <coughs> Being nosy, I asked him, why did they do that? And he says, well, we put you in, it's, it's called a coffin corner of, of the of, of the Armada. And uh, we were going to go into Bizzurri, big a big ship, a big uh, uh, seaport in North Africa. North, and, okay. They were going to drop us off there. And uh, they did, and uh, why why did they call it Coffin Corner? Because you, you're on the outside of the, the convoy, and that's where the Germans would go for they with go, their submarines. They go for the outside ships, so knock them off. But and, but your ship made it. Oh yeah, and uh, we got into Brazzaville, and uh, it took us off, put us up the. Uh, up in the woods, and uh, they gave us overcoats. Overcoats. Yeah, that was kind of a surprise. Well, what time of year was this? But uh, well, approximately when? And night. This was forty-three. It was, you know, late forty-three. Late forty-three, and but uh, we got. Uh, they gave us overcoats. They said you're going to need them. I said, boy, you know, you could cook an egg on a tank right at that time. But it turned cold, and then we learned that the, the desert was hot in the daytime and cold at night. Ah, so you were in the desert in North Africa. Right. 
and then we were there for about a week, and then they transferred me to my combat unit, which was the uh, 45th Division. That was your, the, your division was the 45th what, Combat Infantry? Infantry? Yeah. Yep. Infantry Division? Right. And were you assigned to some assigned reg to, regiment or? No, I was assigned to F Company, uh, the, ninth, the 157th Infantry Regiment. Okay, so that was your? It was my home. That was your home. And uh, they put me in a squad, I was a private. They put me in a squad, and uh, my squad leader was an Indian. And you come to find out. An, in, an Indian? An Indian. An American Indian. American Indian. And I found out that the that that whole regiment was about maybe 35, 40 percent Indians, real Indians. How that that seems unusual. No, it doesn't because if you read the history of Colorado and those places, there was a lot of combat between the Indians and the uh, cavalry. Mm -hmm. But finally, they got together, and when the war broke out. The Indians volunteered to go. So was this regiment somehow yeah. from Colorado or Colorado Oklahoma? And Oklahoma. So that explains it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so we had a lot of Indians in it. Very good people. And so, were you, so you were in Africa. Uh, did you stay long in no, Africa? I stayed maybe about two weeks, and uh, they put us on the ship, and we landed at. Uh, Italy. And where uh, where did you land? We landed south of Naples. Okay. And, uh, Basically on the on the Vesuvius on the side, west side of the Vesuvius, the, uh, the Vesuvius volcano. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what did you? So what? What then? Well, uh, they sent. Uh, then I was was assigned to the, my base, my squad, and everything. And uh, from, that point, from that point on, we went from Naples in combat. So you basically went to combat. You're right. So what? where did you go from Naples? Kind of just walk us through the, well, we, the path. We, went, we were going north, and uh, we went about maybe another 50 miles before we got to the mountains. Were you fighting your way? All, fighting our way. All the way through? M most of the way through. But, so what, uh, was, what, what was that like, Pat, fighting your way well, the through? The first time, uh, it was a shock, I'll be honest with you. I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. I had never shot at anybody, and, I, and nobody ever shot at me. And, Before uh, this? Probably. You mean in your previous experience? I never, of never had that. <laughs> right. And so, my first night in combat, my squad leader, Joe Thomas was his name, he's in the Indian, and uh, he told me, he says, uh, you and you, you and you are going to be on duty tonight. And we were on the front lines, and he said, there's a gully. On to your left, he says, the Germans would like to probably infiltrate that way. Through the gully? Through the gully. So two, two of the guys and myself, we sat there, and I had a burning automatic rifle. Now, Brown. That, that could fire 20 rounds just by holding the trigger. It's all the 20, 20 rounds you can go. Well, being a recruit, I heard all this noise down there, and the other two guys, just like me, they heard it. So we opened fire and raked the whole damn thing down. And uh, Joe came up and he finally said, yeah, what's the matter? And I, we told him. He said, well, we'll check it out in the morning. We check it out in the morning, we found we had killed a horse. <laughs> no, no Germans. He just, really killed the horse. Yeah, you know, we filled him up with a lid, I guess. But, uh, well, that was an unfortunate horse. Yeah, he was. And then we moved into the mountains. In, so you were just moving basically north. Yeah, always. Always north. Yeah, always. I mean, you were basically heading, were, were you heading, was the objective Rome? Or? Rome was our objective. Okay, okay. And that's what we, they told us anyway. 
So you got into the mountains. We got, I, we, we got at, into the mountains and and uh, we had combat up there for a while, for about maybe a week. Meaning that you were exchanging fire with right. the Germans. Right. And what was that like? I mean, were you wounded at that point? No. Any, I, um, no, I made, I made sure I stayed in my hole. The yeah. foxhole was key. Foxhole was key. And uh, we took the ob objective we wanted. Which is what? What was the object? What was the first objective? It was to take a take a hill. Take a hill. Take a hill. The Germans were on the top of the hill. Right. We got the hill. Our, our, our regiment did. And uh, then. Uh, did you capture? Uh, take prisoners? I didn't. Somebody else did probably, but I didn't. I, mm -hmm. And uh, we got up there, and uh, this officer came from artillery, and he wanted to. Mm -hmm to uh, direct indirect fire on the Germans. Indirect but, fire. Right, Is but he had to have, he had to get, get close to him. And uh, so my, my platoon leader picked me in to be his guard. We moved out front and... Uh, in front of your lines? Right. So. Uh, I was here, and the Germans were here, and in between we were laying there, and he was directing fire. That's all I had to do was protect him. Protect the artillery? The artillery officer. Who was directing fire? Right. So he was communicating back to right. artillery that was firing at the Germans. That's correct. And uh, then they, they spotted us. The Germans? Yeah. And they fired on us. There was in the afternoon, I remember that much, and uh, they pinned us down so we couldn't move. Just the two of you? Just the two of us, and uh, they couldn't hit us, but they kept us pinned down, and it started snowing, and it was like a sleet, and we stayed there all night and part of the next day, and uh, finally... And you were just lying there? Just lying there. No, no movement. You couldn't move, and uh, because every time you moved, they, they, they could hear you. They fire over your head because we were in a depression, and uh, we got uh, got rescued, if you want to call it that. They finally got us out of there, but unfortunately for me, uh, my legs were frozen. And frozen, frozen from my knees down, and uh, they were they were beginning to turn, turn. different color, and I couldn't walk. So, so was this frostbite? Well, I guess you would call it that. And uh, so they put me on a stretcher and got me back to behind my lines. Now up in the mountains, you couldn't have no no vehicles, no roads, no nothing. It's just the mountain. Just no, okay. And uh, our we had uh, mules that, that would carry our equipment up and down. Mules? Yeah. And uh, the mules came from uh, Massachusetts, and the, and the mule, mule people were from Massachusetts. From Massachusetts? <laughs> yeah, I was surprised to hear that. Mules? Yeah. Because the Italian mules were too small. They couldn't carry the loads. The American mule, mules are big, and uh, <laughs> they're strong. And uh, so those medics up there, was, he says, we're, we're going to put you on a mule and take you out. On a mule? Yeah, I said, he said, you ever have that? I said, I've only seen a mule from a distance. I never saw it on one. <laughs> and uh, so the sergeant was with him. And uh, he came up to me and he says, you, now he says, you sit on that mule? He said, you don't do nothing. He said, I'll take care of everything. We'll get you out of here. So were you sitting upright on this mule? And I was sitting on there, straddling, tied up to him, so I wouldn't fall off. Because your legs were not functioning. No. And uh, we started down the mountains on these trails. Got a, you look down, you see the ground way the hell down below you. And steep, he, he, steep he, drop, uh, sharp, big uh, drop. Oh yeah. And uh, you always call it merrier. And then Mary gets real, 
ruffled and he, he had a rope in her nose and he had to tighten it a little bit and she would cool right out. Her name was Mary, I remember that. Mary. And, Mary the uh, Mule. Right. Then I got got back down to the bottom, there was an ambulance waiting for me. They, they took me uh, all the way back to uh, to a ship. and uh, To a ship? They had ships. Uh, a hospital ship? No, no. Just a uh, cargo ship or something. And then they dropped me off at Naples in the hospital. To get you to Naples. Yeah. Okay. They had a big hospital there for us. And uh, they, uh, just before that happened, I was in the, uh, a uh, evacuation hospital before I went to the big one. And that was intense. And uh, there was something else. I know it's never been that way before, but the hospital was from Massachusetts, from Worcester, Mass. You mean the people, the, the, Everybody the hospital was, unit? The whole hospital was from there. And well, so you were right at home. Yeah, I was, and uh, I was probably the youngest kid in the tent. Now, and by the way, you were, what, like 18 at the time? 18. And I was probably the youngest one in the tent, but I couldn't walk, so they, they had a weight on me. And it was Christmas. And they, Christmas of 43, then? Christmas of 43, <clears throat> no, yeah. And uh, we had a, uh, a stove in, in, in there. It had two, three stoves in there to keep the tent warm. But the nurses would come in there and they would make tent I'd make toast for you. Toast? Yeah. And uh, the first time I ever had applesauce <laughs> on my bread. And uh, they call it apple butter. And uh, so the nurse came over. She knew I was from Massachusetts. She knew I was Irish. And so <laughs> she says, uh, you Irish men like to drink. <laughs> I said, well, I said, really, a little bit, yes. And she said, you ever have much? I said, no. And uh, that probably wouldn't let, let us to do it, but he did it. And uh, <laughs> so she was with the, uh, the head, head, nurse, head uh, doctor there. And she says, well, we got Christmas presents for everybody in the tent. She said, we'll start with you. We've got something for you to drink. Well, she had cognac. I, never, I didn't even know what type of cognac it was. It could have been, it could have been anything. And so this she, was your first, wouldn't be your first drink. It was. Not bad. And she, so they filled the little glass up about that much, and she said, "Now you got to drink this all at one time." Hmm. Well, not knowing what the hell I was drinking, I did. Well, tears came to my eyes, and I coughed, and I sputtered, and everything <laughs> else. I I couldn't get out of bed because my legs wouldn't allow me. And she said, "My God," she said. Are you, sure, are you sure you're Irish? And I said, yeah. <laughs> of course, everybody in the tent got a big charge out of it. I bet and, they did. Yeah, so then from there... Uh, so what did they do What did they do to your... Well, they were giving me shots initially, and then they, they sent, from, sent me from the uh, tent hospital to Naples to a different one, and they were, they were continuing giving me shots. And uh, then they sent me back to North Africa, and uh, for the, for the, uh, another hospital. And uh, in order to, to move me, they had to put me in a box. Box. Yeah. They you mean had your, my legs. You mean your lower, bo your legs. From here down, my leg, my body was in a box. Nothing in there. No towel. No. Uh, no blankets. No nothing. And uh, because they couldn't touch it. And uh, it hurt it hurt so bad, and uh, finally uh, <coughs> they uh, fixed me up, and uh, where the, my legs came back again. And, so you uh, recovered. Yeah, so I recovered. Then they sent me back from Africa, back to uh, Naples, and from Naples they sent me to. Uh, Put me on the ship for the invasion of uh, Anzio. Ah, 
So that's how, okay. Yeah, that's how I got the NCO. So, so tell us about that. Were you, were you on the ship going, uh, the invading? You know, just, to, just, to put, just put me on the ship and then uh, for the invasion of Anzio, I, I could walk and everything. We had the landing crash and then they were, we were not in the original waves going in, we were later ones. So the, we, they drove us right up on the sand and dropped us. And then so you were in the, by in, unit. in the later waves going in, or yeah. the early, okay, into mm -hmm. Anzio. Right. And uh, so you got on the beach. And I got back to my unit. Same so unit you I found had. your unit. Yeah. Were, were you right there close to the beach? Yep, initially. And then they uh, moved us up to Mussolini's Canal. M Mussolini's Canal? Muss Mussolini had a big, big canal there. And uh, we dug, dug in there. <clears throat> and uh, I had I had just happened to have dug my hole right beside uh, uh, what the hell's the name of that guy? Uh, uh, the, the monument? Uh, the, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, it was a, 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 a uh, well, I a big building. It was it was a monument in there, a big one. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where they dug me in, uh, and uh, we uh, started living in a hole. Living in a hole. Yeah. And uh, what was that like, living in a hole? <laughs> each one, each one of us did, did it differently. We, where we could find you, you put, try to make a house out of it, but it was a hole, and. Uh, but you basically stayed there, slept. I mean, were you, we did you get there. out of the hole? We, no, we, we could get out of the hole, do what we had to do, and get back in, or, or just stay, stay right there until they show you. But to get the in. enemy was, was, uh, was it rifle or more uh, mortars? No, it was artillery. Artillery. And, yeah, it was the Hermann Goring division that was facing us. Which one? Hermann Goring. Hermann Goring. Yeah, one of the top divisions. Basically, uh, this was an armor, I mean, uh, uh, infantry, artillery. But they had artillery and everything. And uh, they were shelling every once in a while to make sure we were awake. And uh, so... So were you exchanging fire or just, you, you were basically in a defensive position? Right. And uh, the thing is, we were infantry. We had to stay where we were. Uh, artillery people could move around. Right. And uh, so uh, Garibaldi's tomb is what it was. Garibaldi's tomb? Yeah. You, you were right was, there at Garibaldi's? I was here and I was here. Huh. And okay. we couldn't get in it. And uh, I lost my, my mate. He got, got sick and they left him. And I got another kid in there with me, brand new from the States. And uh, his name was Brown. And uh, we were making breakfast out of a canyon with sea rations. And they were talking, and the next thing, a shell hit our hole. Hit your hole? Hit the hole right on the, right on the top of it, because we had a little roof. And uh, that's, what, that's all I knew. And then the, I saw a light, and they were digging me out. I, I was buried alive, actually. And Brian got his neck broke. Oh. And he died, and uh, what saved me was my helmet having to slip down over my face. It gave me a little bit of air left. But my platoon sergeant saw, saw it happen, and he got some more people when the shelling stops. He got up there in time, and he dug me out. And uh, then I uh, had to go back to the hospital. You had to, so you were injured, or oh, you were yeah. you, uh, wounded. I mean. Yeah. And uh, so they went back to the hospital. They took me on the ship to back to Naples. And uh, then uh, I recovered, and they sent me back to, to, to the front lines. At Anzio? At Anzio? Anzio sent me back because they needed replacements. And I got there, and unfortunately, I was in. Uh, I was 
doing something. I forgot near the uh, the hospital up there, the, the tent hospital. At Angio. At Angio. And they were sitting right on top of the ground. And the Germans were shelling the place, and they, they hit this two of these tents. And they killed uh, six nurses. And uh, uh, after that, the front line took no prisoners. Wow. I mean, because, you know, the, you kill a nurse, you, you better, better be running. But uh, it, it was very bad. And uh, then uh, we broke out of Anzio to go to Rome. And we now, this was just timing. This was, was this like the winter time, like early 40? Well, we got up there in June and uh, in the cold weather. It wasn't a wasn't what you call it, real winter, but it was, it was cool at night. But then we stayed there for a while. It was, the, I think it was April or May. We broke out for Rome. Broke out of An from Anzio. From Anzio, to head to Rome. That was the the objective was to capture Rome. Right, and uh, we we took off, and uh, I had a job. Uh, to, uh, I, I was acting as squad leader now, and I have in charge of my, my people. So you were a sergeant? And I was a corporal at you, that time. From private, you, oh, private first, and then you became a corporal, right. squad leader. Right. <clears throat> and uh, they told me I was, had to make contact with the 34th Infantry Division, which is on our right flank, with another squad from them. So the two divisions, when they're moving, could maintain contact with each other. Both the 45th and the 34th. 34th, right. And uh, <clears throat> finally, uh, we broke out of there. And, and I'll never forget that. Uh, we came into Rome from the west. and uh, Into Rome from the west. Yeah, the whole regiment. And uh, I was with this uh, lieutenant. and. Uh, he had my, my squad with him. We were the head of our regiment, more or less, uh, as a guy, I guess. And then we had the biggest crowd you ever saw in your life. And greeting they, you in Rome? In Rome, greeting us. <laughs> and we had drink and food and everything, anything you wanted. It was fantastic. You were the, the liberators. Yeah, we were. And by the, by the time we got separated a little bit, the whole regiment was gone, <laughs> all mixed up. With the local? With, with the local people. Where were the Germans, by the way? They were falling back. They were keeping falling back yeah, as did. you went? They didn't touch Rome. Did, did no, not? They did not. They didn't, they didn't damage it, let me put it that way. But uh, they moved out. And uh, my, my, my history is weak. Where was M Mussolini? Was he already? I mean, was he still alive? I, I no, I don't think so. I think he was. Yeah, he was. He was alive. They captured him when uh, up north, farther north. Yeah, we were gone by then. Oh, uh, okay. And uh, so they took our whole division, and they moved us from uh, from Rome down to Mount where Mount Vesuvius is, the volcano. Okay. And, uh, I, okay. And they. they we were training for the invasion of southern France. So basically, you completed your mission in Italy, right? Which was Rome, right? And uh, they went down there, and we had training there for a while. Then they put us on the ship, and uh, they put a, a hospital ship off our, off our port side with us, and. Uh, So the guys wanted to go swimming, and uh, we used to just take our clothes off and go swimming and, and, and do golf. And uh, so the captain of the ship says, no, he says, we know you're not going to wear your bathing suit or you don't have them or, or nothing, you're going to just be bare. He says, if you think you're going to go to that ho hospital <laughs> ship, you've got another thing coming. And he you said, mean where the nurses might be? Yeah. 
you could see them up there, and uh, they were having a ball. The nurses? Yeah. <laughs> well, wa wa watching, watching all us, of the swimmers? Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, Did you swim? I like to swim, oh yeah. But so so you, sw you were part of this? Yeah, we just dive off the ship, and, the, and, and the, there's an LST, and they yep. drop the ball down. You just oh, so you go right off the ramp? And back on the ramp. But uh, we, we were there, I guess, maybe four or five days. And uh, So that was kind of an R&R? &R? Like that. A little I mean, bit. Nobody was shooting at you. You are having good food. Everything was going nice. So when was this like? I mean, had it, was it summertime summer. now? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> In and, 1944. Yep. Yeah. And uh, we uh, pulled out of Naples, heading for uh, our, our uh, target, which had been southern France. And, so uh, this, was per this was invading, making an invasion of southern France. Right. <clears throat> and was the invasion at... Normandy was going on at the same, or it happened well, in June, had, right? That had already happened. That had already happened yeah, in we, June. We were in southern France, I guess, about a month after they took. I okay. They were trying to take uh, the, the pressure off the front, up, up yes, uh, on the other uh, big. But uh, so you didn't really have too far to go to get up to your invasion? Well, no, or? we didn't have too far to go. We, we got there. Uh, I, I was being trained for demolitions. Oh, you had demolitions training? Yeah, my squad did. And uh, there was three teams, and they had these uh, obstacles on the beach. The Germans did? Yeah, right. To and basically keep the boats from coming up on the, right. the beach? Right. Not so much the boats. The boats could, could, could get land, and the troops right. can land. But you couldn't get your, your oh, vehicles on it. The, the, the equipment coming off the boat. Right, you couldn't get them on the beach. So we had to blow those things up, which we did. So your squad blew My them squad up? My squad and a couple of other ones. So you had to go in, so that meant you we went, went in, in early? We went in first. And, uh, what was that like? Well, that was, uh, that was all right after we got there, but we got in there, we, uh, we had three boats. And they had this great big all darn battleship, a French battleship. They made a big story French on French battleship? That. It was French. And uh, they did a story on that later on in the movie that the, the French battleship was the first ones to fire back on Germany uh, uh, on, their, on their homeland. Really? Yeah. And so we went, like, they were here. And we were here, we went by them like that, but, oh, I guess we could have been maybe 150 to 200 yards away from them. And them goddamn guns went off. And our little boys just went up and down. I thought we were going to go for a swim. The big guns on oh, the battleship. Oh, God. Really shock you when you hear them. And uh, then we land on the beach, did our job. Now, how did you do your job? I mean, explain that dem demolitions a bit. What well, did you do? Well, what we do, we make the packages up. Make what? Make, we make a package up. Package. And, and with the fuse on the outside. And what was the package? I mean, what was the explosive? Well, we used uh, TNT. TNT. Yeah. And uh, we didn't use dynamite because dynamite, well, if it sets around a lot, you can feel it as wet, you leave it alone because it becomes sensitive. And so we never used uh, dynamite. Uh, dynamite. I mean, uh, you know, dynamite. We never didn't use those things. So we, the package was TNT. TNT. With a fuse? Oh, yeah. On it? And, and what did you, you just. All we do is just uh, put, put it around the, around the objective, then you back off quite a ways. And you have a wire to it, and when you get them all set, you just. Oh, well, why? Oh, this was electrical or a light a match? No, no, neither one. They were batteries. It's okay, so yeah. it was ba ba battery power. Right. Okay. Now, all we had, they was tied. They had tied to us. All we had to do was crank it off, and boom. So that would de demolish that yeah. obstacle. It, it would knock it down. 
that way. So that a vehicle could... Right, especially your tanks. So how much time did you spend doing this? Oh, maybe 15, 20 minutes. But overall, I mean, how many, I mean, were there a lot of obstacles that you had to... No, yeah. we, had, uh, we had enough for our, for our route war. So you just cleared space. For us. Enough yeah. to get the vehicles. Right. The, the, another unit was doing the same thing up and down the beach. So did you, was this like a day's, a half a day's yeah. worth of work? No. Yeah. There were enough people going in and doing it that, that you didn't have time to to uh, play around. Do it fast. You and did get it fast. Out. And then, so once, then did you, you went ashore? We were on shore. I mean, you were on shore, but then, then what did you do? Well, then this lieutenant had a, a mission to uh, go up with a uh, recon unit. And so what we do, the people that are on the beach reverted back to him, and we took off for uh, going north. Took off to go north? Yeah. How long were you, so this was at St. San Maxime? The beach, that, that was the invasion uh, the, the, point? All the invasion, no, no. The invasions had uh, four divisions going in. Four? Oh, yeah. And then another one going into uh, Marseille. Wow. And, uh, so this was, a, it was a, a big operation. This was big, but not quite as big as Normandy. Oh, no, no. But still huge. Four, four divisions. Yeah. But uh, what they were going to do, we didn't know that, but what, what they were going to do, when you look at the map, go up as far as uh, <clears throat> Dole, France, and they would make a, a right-hand turn going into Germany. So and basically, just we, keep pushing. Yeah, we went up this. Our units went up alongside Switzerland, and then we get back by, by them. And then we swung back into uh, into Germany. Okay, so that was the objective. But yeah. how how long were you basically in the beach area? Oh, maybe a couple of hours. That's all. That's all. Oh, and then you took off. Yeah. So the whole division took off? Well, no, just, the people, on, just the people on the beach took off. Then what you do, you have to understand what you, what you do. Your 45th Division has three regiments. Yours was the 157th. We're 157, then there's a, a, a 180th. They were beside of us. Same division, two regiments. And then the th third regiment is, is always in reserve. In, uh, they were, okay, so the two main ones and then yeah. a reserve. And yeah, no, each division did it the same way. So did the two regiments then march off? They, they push off up north. Going north. Yeah, so, once, once they get on the beach, they spread out to their units and move on up. <clears throat> so, so at the end of the first day, where were you? I mean, in well, the... We were pretty well in because they... The Germans had vacated, vacated the, the area. So and basically the Germans at this point, were they in retreat? They were in retreat. They knew the sh they, they could see what was happening. They didn't have the stuff to stop us. So okay. they pushed back, and as they pushed back, they get deeper and deeper in, in manpower. And then the, then the fight starts. Okay, so when did you... As you were pushing north, when did you first encounter, you know, first fight, oh, have to fight? Oh, I was just I would make a guess. A bit. I mean, a pro, you know, a couple of weeks or? Oh, no. Uh, we didn't, you know, you don't do that when, you, when you're moving, you move fast. And uh, I would say, as a guess, about... Uh, Four or five days, we were about 50 miles in. 50 miles in? Yeah, but then we hit them. Then you hit them? They Basically hit, they what? They hit us. In other words, they finally formed a defensive position. Oh, yeah, because they had enough people, and they were back up, and they were close to their homeland. And they didn't want you oh, in their homeland? They didn't want you there. So what happened when you met up with them? Well, I got up to Doyle, and uh, I ran into a, a lot of artillery fire and I got got banged up pretty bad on it and uh, you mean you were, were wounded and everything else and 
So uh, they, I ended up in the hospital, and uh, then they, I didn't know it at the time, but then they put me on, a, on an ambulance, sent me down to uh, Marseille, and on a ship, they sent me back to Italy. And uh, So what was your, would, would you mind explaining what happened to you? I mean, besides, the, were, were, were you wounded well, or physically? Uh, no, I was, I was wounded, but uh, physically, when, when the shells get too close to you, it can do things to you. And sometimes you recover fast, sometimes you don't. And, uh, and in this particular case, uh, that was a problem, I guess. And they didn't want to be, be have us up that, these kind of problems with them because they wanted the wound of you going. So they would, they, they would evacuate you. Right, and you were evacuated. Yeah, back to Italy. And uh, then the... Uh, back to where? Back to Naples? No. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, Naples. But that's where it was we stopped. But anyway, the war ended soon after that. So... And I came home. So were you basically in Italy when the war ended? Yeah. Oh, you were? Yeah. I see. In 1945. I guess it was, yeah. yeah. And, uh, April. And, uh, April wow. So, so I came back home. So what? I was so, a sergeant now. Oh, you've been yeah. you moved right up the yeah. up the line. Yeah. So uh, what? 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 what we, and and when you? So were you a sergeant when you were in, were wounded? I was I was a sergeant when I went to shore at the, in in the French. Yeah. So what was your, and your, so you were a squad leader or a platoon? Squad leader. Squad leader. Yeah. So what did it feel like when you heard the war was over? Or did you, I, you must have heard, uh, obviously. I don't know. I, uh, I, I didn't think too much about it. Actually, I had volunteered to go to, go to, uh, to uh, Japan if, with, a, with a ranger company, but the war stopped, so I took care of that. But you were prepared to go to Japan with the Rangers? That's right. But uh, the, the war stopped and they, they disbanded the Rangers and I came home. So you came home, were you back with your unit when you came home or did you go no, home? No, no, no. I, I came home just like I was going going out this door by right. myself. From Naples? In other words... Yeah. There's a whole, a whole ship full of people going home. Were they basically... People who had been wounded, like you, or no, a whole bunch of just no, different kinds. Just different kind of people. The war is over with now. Right, every, every right. And uh, if you were wounded or some general, they, they they have a different ship for you. So but, you left from Italy to go home. Where yeah. did you land in the states? I landed in. Uh, we came in the states. And we came off of the boat in, in uh, South Carolina at the, on the tail end of a, a hurricane. Tail end of a hurricane? Yeah. Well, how was that? Yeah. Well, that was, a, that was a doozy. And we were having a celebration on board the ship. That, they had good food for us. <laughs> oh. And uh, when we got into that, that hurricane, we got on the tail end of it, and there was still a lot of waves. The boat would get tipped like this. My plate would go down the, down here. <laughs> it come back, and I get somebody else's. It was a mess. <coughs> we got fed though, but uh, the ship it was uh, one of these uh, cargo ships. Cargo ships. Yeah, they're very light in the water, and uh, so you did a lot of rocking and yeah. rolling. So uh, we got, we got home in Fort Devens, and I got discharged and went home. So you made it back from South Carolina to Fort Devens? Yeah. You were district did were were a bunch of other people oh, yeah. at Devens at the time? There's, Getting... a, there's other people there that were coming back home and uh, discharged very, real quick. So what was it like so you uh, so you were discharged, you and so where did you go from Devons? Your home at that point was... It's Greenfield. So you were in Greenfield. Right. So you went home. So right. what, what was it like when you, uh, when you rolled up to your street in your house? You know, 
that's a very good question you're asking because I was probably like a lot of other people. You you go home, you know, and everybody greets you today, and tomorrow they expect you to be doing something else. And uh, in those days, and uh, so it was relatively the it was, relatively, it was a relatively short welcome home. Yeah, more or less. And uh, were there people on the streets, or I mean, in other words, was everybody? Uh, Celebrating, or had the celebration no, they, already they, happened? No, they, they, the celebrations had already happened. I mean, uh, uh, between the time we left Italy, uh, the, the war was ended. Right. And so the celebrations are gone. So you came back. You were back in Devon's a month or two after. Uh, oh, it was about three months. Three months. So. So everything is quiet. Quiet. Yeah. So. But you, anyway, your but your parents were there at. at yeah, you know, my parents were there. They welcomed me, stuff like like that. And you were well, so you were now twenty or so. Well, yeah, uh, I guess. Yeah. Approximately yeah. twenty. I mean, it was nineteen. Well, wait a minute, twenty or twenty-one? I guess. I've lost track of it. Okay. Anyway. He must have been somewhere around twenty. Yeah, well, probably around twenty. Twenty twenty-one. Right. So, what'd you do then? Well, my father was superintendent of the railroad up there in Greenfield, so he gave me a job, and uh, on the, on the railroad, I had two or three different ones on there, and uh, so I was having dinner with him one night in the, in the house, and because uh, I was still living with my parents, and uh, I said, Dad, I says. They're taking money out of my pay. Uh, I said, <coughs> they don't tell me what, what it is for. I said, uh, can you tell me what, why they're doing that? Well, if you know the Irish people, especially the, the, the older ones, you, don't, you never ask them what you're going to do or, or ask them what they want. And you. They uh, they want if they want to do it they do it if they don't they won't and as my father just said when you retire from the railroad you'll find out <laughs> well that was a very di uh, direct question I said thank you very much finished my dinner the next morning I went down to the uh, recruit recruiting officer I said I'd like to get back in in the service wow. And uh, I said, I, I was a sergeant when I got out. I'd like to get my rank back too, if I could. And just for reference here, are we? Uh, how much time had? How much time? I had been, were, were you a civilian? About a year. About a year. About a year, year and a half. So uh, we were I, I, 46, I 47 enough. time frame. Yeah, I, ha I had enough of that, and uh, so. So you got back in. I got back in with my rank I had, and that was it. And did you, so was this in Greenfield again that you went back? No. Uh, I've been, been back once or twice. No, I mean, in terms of, where where were you when you re-entered the service? Oh, I was in Greenfield when I re-entered. But then I went into a, a different fort and uh, stayed there for a while. Where, where'd you go? Down to uh, South Carolina in, in, a, in a different camp. And I had a job there, a good one. And uh, what was that job? Uh, I was a squad leader. In, 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 Still in, in the infantry. Yeah. Oh yeah. But now we're not in wartime. Not in wartime. In so the, training, you were were you training folks? Oh or? yes, but no, it was different. You were on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. You uh, worked from 8 until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. On uh, Thursday and Friday, you had worked a half a day. Hmm. And sometimes uh, you work just a, uh, I get a whole day off. And uh, that was, the Army was a peacetime army. And there uh, was not too much going on. So how'd that feel? I mean, what was that like for you, having been so 
intently involved in the war in the earlier years. You mean being back? What, what was it like serving in peacetime versus wartime? It you know, was, was that... different. It was, uh, it was a little bit stricter because uh, we didn't have the equipment we had, uh, we needed. So the, what you had, you had to keep up, uh, keep up going, right. good with it. So you had to be r ready, right. and uh, you weren't getting it, uh, your units weren't getting filled up. There, where you had forty-five people in the uh, in the uh, platoon, you might have maybe thirty in peacetime. Because the draft had been, the draft was the draft over. Was mostly gone. Okay, so time. all of a sudden it was a volunteer army. Yep, it was. Were there many like you who were? They went back. Veterans. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people went back. They did. Yeah, uh, you you have to understand that when you're in combat, that's one thing. You can do things you you wouldn't be allowed to do in peacetime, and then in peacetime. If you try to do those things, you get, get your hands slapped. And so it was strict. And uh, I didn't mind that and uh, <coughs> or anything else uh, because I always did my job. Now, what? when I became a sergeant until till today, uh, I've always been in the position where I was a leader. I was the boss on, on my particular unit, regardless of what it was. And uh, some people wonder how, how to do that. And I uh, said, so, well, I like what I was doing and I was doing it good. And uh, they appreciated it. And your troops must have appreciated you as their leader. Well, I always got along good with my troops because uh, I was uh, on the up and up with them. If they were screwing up, and I, I would tell them, uh, it's a court martial offense, but we're, we're going to work it out between us. And it, it does. So they knew where they stood with you? Yeah, always. And uh, I'd like to show you something downstairs later on. When I was in Special Forces, what I was just tell you, uh, my troops... Uh, they respected me. I bet they did. And uh, one, of them, one of them did a drawing downstairs. We'll take a look at that yeah, after the, uh, the interview. It was something else. Right. And uh, I enjoyed it. So after South Carolina, where, where did you go? Well, I came back to Fort Devens. And that was after how long? I mean, were you in South Carolina for a year or so? Oh, well, maybe... Maybe a year. Okay, so and, uh, 47, 48. Right. Then huh. they sent me to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, which is the home of the infantry. And uh, I was there for a while with the 3rd Infantry Division, 7th Regiment. And uh, then they were going to reopen Fort Devens. What the hell is her name? She's from Maine. Uh, she's still alive. Uh, uh, Senator. She wanted the. Edith um, North? Pardon? Was it Edith? Edith North? Uh, I think it was. Edith Norris Rogers. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Uh, she was pushing to get Fort Devens open because yes. it'd be money and, and jobs for a lot of people up here. So she got it open. Well, down there, I was in the uh, 7th Infantry Regiment down there in Fort. Uh, Fort Benny, and uh, they picked me and, and my squad to come up up here to open it up. Open uh, Devons? Yeah, open Devons up, and they had a lieutenant with them. And he was a real, well, real lady, so I can't say it, but uh, <laughs> you can imagine what he was. And so we went through the barracks, and uh, we found these clothes, and he was he ordered them to put them on outdoors, so we put them outdoors. So he was going to burn them. 
So I told him, I said, you can't do that. That's government property. And he says, uh, he said, what's your rank? And I told him. He said, what's mine? He had to be a first lieutenant. I said, fine. We'll burn him, we'll burn him. Uh, the, the back, that thing backfired on him. He burned him, but his father was a brigadier general. Brigadier general. Yeah, and he found that out. And uh, he, he, that, that lieutenant really got it. Not only that, for burning had, government property, he had burned up, and he got got, uh, got a, um, Article Fifteen, which is a like a, what's that a, like, a reprimand or something? Yeah, That's like a serious. reprimand, yeah, pretty serious. but like a reprimand on on his record. And, well, uh, the sergeant was right. Yeah, the sergeant was right, and uh, so, so what'd you do in Devons? All right, I have well, to we, opening it up. I that's mean, you, all right. We opened it up, and the draft came back on. Because of what? Because what the hell was that? For, Korea concerns? No. Or? I don't know. They, they brought the draft back on. I forgot what it was for, but anyway, they did. And uh, I had this barracks, and now, now I'm charged the barracks, plus other people. And... <laughs> It was cold, and I had these kids from Tennessee and Kentucky, and then I had these kids from from uh, the uh, Puerto Rico, right, and um, so I had one group upstairs and the other group downstairs, in the barracks. In the barracks, <clears throat> there was about fifty or sixty kids, you know. And you were in tr charge of them. I was them? in charge of them, and I, and I had my my sleeping quarters. I had a my own particular room and everything. And uh, <clears throat> I am now a staff sergeant. Staff sergeant? Yeah. And uh, I heard a, a rumble going on out there, and I went out, and, uh, and the people upstairs were coming downstairs and fighting with these guys. And finally, I got them done. And I what the hell's going on? Well, the kids from the South, you know, they, they had their, their kind of music. Music. And the kids from the <laughs> from the islands had their kind of music. <coughs> Neither one liked the other guy's music. And that caused them to fight? Right. And the, the ones from the uh, from the islands, uh, they go into Boston. And they come back and be all chewed up in the neck. You don't want to get into that. And, uh, but anyway. Uh, so anyway, so you were the so you were a staff sergeant. You were in charge of this barracks, and yes. was there like a was this a platoon? It, of, was, it was just two. It, it was a platoon, but they were they were redoing the army. You know, they were building them up, building up the army. Yeah, and uh, I came. Uh, uh, I got there, and I got a chance to come back to uh, back up here, and I did. And uh, I, I, I was. You spoke of playing fo football at some point. Yeah, you know, I came back to, up here to Fort Devons. That Devons, and yeah. were you? And uh, I played football for two years. You played football for oh, yeah. for the army. Yeah, and I had a good time. And so then they sent me to uh, Washington State to join the. Uh, Second Division, Ninth Regiment, and okay, Ninth Regiment, Second Division. Right, and uh, so, and uh, what 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 were you? What was the where where were you headed, or what was going on at that time? Nothing. It was, it was just a normal transfer. A normal transfer. Yeah, because yeah, it was an infantry outfit, outfit, and they needed people. So you you said you'd spent two years or so at Devons. Yeah. So we were must be now talking about forty nine or fifty. It's about that. Okay. And uh, we had, uh, the heck was it? Uh, for, for, oh, by, by now, I'm a master sergeant. Master sergeant? Yeah. And uh, I got When promoted, When but, you joined the second division? Yeah. And uh, so uh, I was in the 9th uh, Regiment. And uh, F Company. 
Uh, may I ask you a question about the 9th Regiment? Sure. Is that the Manchus? That's the Manchus. Yeah, they, I'm surprised you know it. Well, I just spoke with another veteran who was also a 9th Did Regiment. Did he tell you about the Silver Cup? No. What about? Well, the 9th Regiment, uh, they were in, the, in China when the Chinese uh, were having a, their revolution. And they, they had a big, the, the West had a big compound there. And uh, the 9th Regiment was part of it. And uh, they, they fought the, the, the regulars that were trying to take over China. The Boxer and, Rebellion? Uh, yeah. And uh, they won out, we won out so that we came back home. And what the Chinese people did, they got uh, silver. They took a si silver from all, all the people. They, they donated it. Silver? Silver. And they melted the silver down. They made a, 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 a big bowl about, 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 that, about that big. And they had, uh, what the hell was it, 24 cups, I think it was. Yeah, it, it was a bowl with, yeah. with cups and beautiful carvings. And, and it was it is worth almost uh, $100,000. Uh, it was worth $100,000 in those days. Mm. But it's hell. And uh, that cup was always guarded by by soldiers. Of, of the ninth? Of the ninth. The Manchus. Yeah. And where wherever the ninth Manchus went, that cup went. Wow! And uh, and there was a there was a saying or something that you guys said, right? Something about keep up the keep up the fire, keep up the fire. Yeah. So you were with the Manchus yeah. in Washington State. Right. So what happened then? Well, I was on duty one night and I got a telephone call from the uh, officer on duty for the regiment. He says, Patty, are you there? And I said, yes, sir. He says, you get on the telephone any, any way you can. He said, get all your people back. Get wherever, them all back? All back. From where? From wherever they were. Some of them were on vacation. Some of them just were on uh, leave. or Leave or whatever. And uh, I says, why, why are we doing this? He says, we're going to war. I said, we're going to war. I said, what is a war? He says, Korea. I said, where the hell is Korea? He said, what the hell are you asking me? He said, I don't know that either. But, uh, and uh, we did. And, so uh, you had to get everybody back. We, we, got, a, we got everybody back. And uh, the hell was the month that was? I forgot the month. And I got it here someplace. But anyway, uh, it was April. April of yeah. 1950? 49. No, yes, 1950. And uh, we got the, uh, let's see, we were told we were going to get some new weapons and everything, new clothes, the whole works. And uh, come to come in and call me and says, Patty says, there's a troop train coming in down in the, down in the docks. He says, go down and get me some people. He says, how many do you want? He said, give me 120. Well, he knew how much, there, there were thousands coming in there because the army at that, that, that time, when the war broke out, started cleaning up all the camps. With, with to bring the troops. To, and we were sending them down to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. Now, our regiment was the first regiment to leave the United States for 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 combat in Korea. The first? The first. And uh, so I went down to the enemy. God, there was thousands of darn soldiers there, you know. And uh, so I went up to this Lieutenant Colonel, and he, he was in charge of the, what was going on. I said, my country commander was 120 people. He said, well, pick them out. I said, uh, I went down the line and said, are you infantry? Yes. No, yes, no. He came up to me and says, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm looking for infantry officers, infantry soldiers. 
He said, no, you're not. I said, I'm not. I said, he said, you go right down there and count up 120 people and take off with them. Oh, so yeah. I like that. Yes, sir. So I can I did that and I brought him back. Now, mind you, we're going to combat. We're supposed to have well-trained infantry people. My platoon, I, I was a platoon sergeant. I had about 25 people in my platoon, and I'm authorized 45. And uh, we went down to that, the roster we had. We had everything in there. We had cooks, bakers, mechanics, you name it, and we had them. And uh, none of them were infantry. None of the new people were infantry? New people were not infantry trained. And what the, the Army had done is loaded Fort, uh, Fort Lewis up with troops. And anybody that needed troops, got them. Didn't make no difference what they were trained to do, they, they got them. And so I was in charge of loading the, uh, our, uh, what the USS Patrick yeah. uh, troop carrier uh, for our people. And uh, we had 24 hours to get that thing loaded. You mean to debark for? Uh, for to debark for career. So no chance to train anybody. No, no, no. We had uh, the only thing we could do is give them clothes and weapons. And you, you give a, a, a clerk a weapon. He said, "What do I do with it? Say, Carry it. It's yours. Don't throw it away." But he'd never fired a. He'd never had a. Apparently rifle. not. He never had the training. And uh, then we pulled out of um, Puget Sound and headed out to the, in the Pacific. And uh, our regimental commander decided he was going to have training on board the ship, at least fire the weapons. And uh, the ship captain was cooperative, and they would throw boxes over the side, and the kids would stand up there and shoot at them. And uh, we would have to train them how to load, name, and fire. And uh, I was kind of lucky because out of the group, I found two sergeants. There were uh, two stripers, corporal sergeants type, and uh, but they had little little training. So I had two people I could depend them on a little bit. But anyway, uh, we did that. Then we got to Japan. We went into Tokyo Bay, and uh, after we got into Tokyo Bay, the ship turned around and came back out. We, we didn't know what the hell was going on, and they finally the captain came on and said, we, our destination's been changed, and we're going someplace else. He didn't say where. So we went down around Japan and came up the, uh, up the canal, up the... Uh, the coast there, and this ship came out of, out of a port, came up alongside of us, and we stopped, and they stopped, and then they loaded ammunition on board ship for us. From ship to ship. From ship to ship. And, uh, I mean, all kinds of ammunition. And uh, we looked and I, at the people, and I asked my lieutenant, I says, I don't know what's happening. And, uh, that lieutenant was, 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 had to be an ROTC officer, I had just got out of school, and I got him as my platoon leader. He was my boss. And he, he, he bugged the hell out of me to want to know what my combat was all about because he knew I had it. But anyway. He was the boss, but you were the- He was the, the boss, the, and I was on to him. You were the, the re real boss. Yeah, and so to speak. But uh, um, we then took off for Pusan. Korea. Korea. And we landed there. It was early in the morning. And uh, we got off board. And uh, they had a troop train waiting for us. And uh, so we got on the docks. There, there was my battalion and the, second, and the first battalion 
was the first two battalions on ahead on the deck. The third battalion was going someplace else. And uh, first and second, okay. And you were the fr in the first, the second, second, and uh, so. When he told us he gave us a you know like a rah rah we're going up front wasn't sure what the hell he was talking about but we got on the train and we went north towards the uh, Nacton River the Nacton River yeah okay and that was a big river coming down th down through uh, Korea and. Uh, <clears throat> We got up there to where we had to get off, and we walked for about a mile to, to the front lines. There was really no front lines there, it was just hills. And uh, we dug in a little bit, and it was late afternoon. And uh, this lieutenant, I said, he's walking all over the place. I said, my God, I said, lieutenant says, Stay down. I said you don't know what, you don't know what's out there, and uh, so had you dug foxholes or yeah, no? We didn't have time for that yet, and uh, we were just getting dark, you know. We was getting dark, and uh, <coughs> then I heard a yell and I turned around, and the lieutenant got hit. They, they were firing at us. He got hit right in the hip, and. Uh, I, I was there a little bit by him, and I said, I laughed. I said, it's part of my laughing, but I said, you weren't in combat. I said, you, you, you just got it. And uh, The very first day. The very first day. And uh, I found out that they, they bandaged him up, sent him back to the rear area, and he went home. Wow. Yeah, you know, he had a pretty bad shot. So much for combat. Yeah, and uh, so you were in charge. Yeah, I was in charge then, and uh, but we had uh, uh, combat from that point on. And what were you? What was uh, the setting? The North Koreans were what on the other side of the river? They were on the other side of the river. Now the first night we had there was, was a hell of a night. I mean. We were more or less out in the open, and uh, I did find a little place where I could dig a little hole and uh, get in it. And I, then we heard all these bugles. Bugles? Bugles. From where? From North Korea, from across the river. And uh, what they were doing, they blow the bugles to, to upset you. And this at nighttime, a big across the river and somebody shooting is can be scary as hell. And uh, was there artillery coming no, over? No, no, just just the, just the bugles. Uh, small arms fire. Small arms. But you could see them coming down the hill, on the across the river. See and the North Koreans. North Koreans blowing those bugles. And uh, they came across the river, and you know, we stopped them in a life but. From that point Just on, it was crazy. Talk, talk a little bit. Of, you say you stopped them, but they were they. I mean, was this? No, well, they they wanted to, they wanted to drive us back, but they couldn't. And uh, we put enough fire out there, and uh, they decided to probably best to go back across the river. Did you go back across the river to no. chase them? No, or? no. Basically, you successfully Stay repelled right. their we, offensive. Right. We didn't want to go across the river. And what was the, the toll? I mean, did you lose? Uh, we lost some people. Uh, I don't know, don't know how many because you didn't have time to, to, to go around counting anybody right. except your own people. And uh, I didn't lose anybody, but uh, scared the hell out of a lot of them. So how long were you basically in this position, de defending that side of the river? Well, we were in, I, I forgot how long we were there, but we were there a bit, maybe a week, week and a half, and we, we crossed the river. So and, you crossed the river. Yeah, but in the meantime, that particularly uh, North Korean unit showed you the difference between Americans and them. 
they they wore sneakers. They wore these uh, long, uh, like a stocking. And they had their food in it. They had their ammunition in it, down around the corner. And so that was their pack, if you will. That was their pack. And uh, they had this thin clothes on. And uh, the unit we fought, they told us about a couple, three days later, that that unit was 45 miles south of us. They'd already gone? They had already gone. Now, American troops would never go 45 miles in a day and a half or two days in a march. We just don't do that. But these guys, they did that and had a big fight down there with another unit. And the thing was, they marched all the way down like that. And, you know, that, that's a lot of, a, a lot of out of a man to do that, but they do it. They travel light. They, they can travel light. Now, this fast. was fast. This was probably in summertime, wasn't it? Or It was, but uh, they, they go fast. Of course, the worst time they get, they, they dress up in different clothes, but in, in the summertime, they were very light. So this was the summer of 1950. Yeah. So you crossed the river and... Much later. Much later? Yeah. So what was going, I mean, like how much later? Oh, well, maybe a week and a half, two weeks. Oh, that's not that long. No. Oh, okay. And, uh, and, and what and what what was the objective then? Oh, it was a uh, different. Just to keep north, keep pushing them back. But keep pushing them back. Because we was in the, in the, like like Anzio was. Uh, we were surrounded there, oh, and and there we was like this is the Necton River. Right. And it goes up like this, and we were in here in Princeton area. Right, right. This and, was still and, in the south. Oh yeah. Right. And these and these people would go up and down in these rivers, and we keep moving up. And as we move up, another unit would come in here and, and push these people. And so the objective was to move out of the south. Keep going north. Same as in uh, Italy. Yep. Just, or France, for just, that matter. Right. Just keep going. Push them around. So were you fighting all the way? Just about. Then I got hit. I got wounded again and uh, sent back to the hospital. And uh, I got wounded three different, twice over there. Twice? The, the, the second time I got wounded, I had to go back to a field hospital and they sent me back to Japan. But the first time you didn't go to a hospital? No, I went to the hospital the first time, but it was local. And then you got back relatively quickly? Right. And, but for the second time, uh, they had to send me back to uh, Japan for, uh, ex for a different kind of uh, care, I guess. How long were you in Japan? Uh, I was in a place called Tokyo. And... Uh, it was a big, big American hospital there. And how long? I'm, I missed. I was about a month there. A month. Yeah. So, so this was so 1950 was moving on. Yeah. Did you go back to your unit? Yeah, but uh, before I went, uh, I was getting better, much better, than, and before I could walk around and do things, and so the doctor says, uh, "You want to do some work?" I said. Uh, Light work is it's not heavy, as I'd like to. Well, they had a um, a Japanese uh, unit that had the catches and stuff like that out there, where we were. He says, uh, "We'd like to have somebody supervise and, and help them and in, in, uh, to uh, take care of themselves in the kitchen." Okay. So I did. What they did, they needed some money, so I got some for for, for their holiday. Some money? Yeah, uh, from the government, from my our people, and then they bought some food. Now they love rice, but over there rice is expensive. It is. Yeah, well, yeah. and uh, they would take rice and barley and mix it together. 
and uh, they weren't happy with that, but they had a celebration coming up, so I got them some good rice. And uh, about two weeks later, I got my orders. I was going back to my unit. And back, the, back up to back the career, and uh, so they had a. They called me up and said, "We'd well, like to have you over here for dinner. Dinner was supper for us." <coughs> So I did. What well, they had, they had a, a dinner for me, hmm. and uh, they had a, uh, a one of these uh, Japanese pies, and uh, they had this uh, uh, sword. I said, "Just give me that sword, you know." Sword? Yeah. Well, the Japanese they like their swords. Sure. And uh, I said, "They're going to give me a gift." Wow. And uh, they used the knife to cut the cake. That's what they did. <laughs> but uh, I thought it was nice that they did it for me. Well, they must have appreciated what yeah. you did for them. Yeah, I guess they did. And so I went back to my unit. Now my unit is in Seoul. Your unit's in Seoul. Seoul. So is that, that's north of Pusan. Oh, yeah, way north. Well, way north, right. Yeah. And uh, we got up there. And uh, my company was uh, was getting ready to go go on Operation Killer, and I'll tell you about it later. And uh, he had uh, the rifle company has three infantry uh, infantry uh, squads and one weapon squad. That's a company. And uh, I got there. They had uh, two infantry. Uh, squads and one weapon and no no third infantry one so when i, I reported back in the well i'm a master sergeant a lot of experience and uh, they didn't have no they had no officer so they didn't have a third one and so the company commander welcomed me back he says uh, he was glad to see me he says uh, i'm going to open up the third platoon. Platoon. There was nobody in it, no, no leader, no nothing. And uh, he says you're going to take it as a uh, as an acting uh, active platoon leader. Well, that means I had the authority of a of an officer, but didn't have the rank. I said, well, where am I going to get these people from? He said, we were sitting in a room there. He said, these officers are going to give you X number of people. And I looked at him. He said, yes. He said, he whispered, you're not going to get the best. <laughs> and uh, I didn't either. You and, didn't get their best. Oh, hell, they going to give me the good people. They give me the, the, the ones they didn't want. So I... Ended up with about 40 people all together. And, uh, in your platoon? In my platoon. And uh, they didn't know each other or anything else. And, uh, well, they did know each other, but uh, they weren't happy people. So I asked, I asked for permission to do, do it, the training my way. He said, be, be ready to move because we'd be moving out in about five days. So this was like a, a, a relatively calm situation in Seoul? Yeah, it was Seoul. They were in reserve. Right. Got and, it. And uh, so I took them down the road. It was snowing out there. And I set them down. I said, you know, I said, you don't know me. I don't know you. And uh, I said, but I know of you. And I said, you, all, all you people were given to me because nobody wanted you. And I said, but I've got you. And I said, now we're going to show these people they were wrong. And we did. And uh, I, I had a good platoon. But if I had known today what I knew then, <laughs> I wouldn't take that. Because after I got them all trained the way I wanted them, we were going to combat. You always throw a point out to uh, feel up, feel somebody out. 
and I got that job, I guess, about 60% of the time. And, Your platoon? Uh, yeah. And uh, he used me because I had people that these other guys didn't like, but they, they, they trusted me and I trusted them, and, and we, we had a good time. So you were on the point a lot. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's a little more dangerous. Yeah, it is, but uh, it worked. So did you encounter, I mean, so you were still marching north? Yeah. And, uh, and were, were you encountering the enemy? Yeah, we were, we were going on what they call Operation Killer. Oh. And that was across the, the, the boundary. And there were going to be three divisions all together in, in that operation. The boundary the, yeah. the, between north and south? Or? Yeah. Oh. It, it's, we were going for like that. And, uh, or was this, chi this wasn't China, or? It was it's still Korea. This was still Korea, okay. It was North Korea, where the dividing line right. between North and South was. Got it, okay. And uh, so uh, we, we were ready for it, and uh, we crossed, and uh, I was acting between the other, and uh, we got going up a valley, and uh, the North Koreans were on a ridge to our flank. And I was back with the battalion commander because I was in the reserve. And uh, he uh, got word that the F Company, my company, and another company were pinned down because the people were firing down on, on their flank and they couldn't do anything. But I had my platoon back here. And uh, so I asked the colonel, I says, no, I was still a master sergeant. And uh, he, he uh, told me that pin, they were pinned down. So I asked him, I said, well, we got two machine gun uh, squads back, back here in, in reserve. I says, if you give, me to, give them to me, I said, I think I can get up this ridge on this side of them and fire infantry uh, crossfire on the on the German on the uh, the Marshall. enemy. This is okay and he ordered the two machine guns up there and I took them and my platoon up that way and we got in the position because it didn't see us and we let go and uh, we we broke it. And they they broke and ran. And, uh, so, so you relieved the the so, pressure. So we relieved the pressure, so the rest of the tank could move. And uh, well, I guess it's been been about about a week later. Uh, matter of fact, it was in March. So this was March of '51, then. Yeah, uh, it was in March, and uh, it was on the 14th. I'll never forget it. Hmm. And I. Uh, he said, uh, we're sending you back to division headquarters. I said, to him, so what the hell did I do wrong now <laughs> to go there? So I went back, and I'm sitting there in a, in a chair, and, and uh, the adjutant was there, and he asking me a lot of questions, and, and uh, I answered him. The general come in. He says, hey, are you Master Sergeant Flint? I said, yes, sir. He says, uh, stand up when you're talking to me. And so I did. <laughs> he pinned gold bars on my shoulders. <laughs> Maybe did a lieutenant he? right there. A second lieutenant right yeah, there. Right there. How'd that feel? Uh, I was pretty surprised, you know. And uh, he says, you got a battlefield commission. He says, uh, we'll send you to another unit. Uh, I said, well, I said, I'd like to make a request. I said, I just want to give up the, the gold bars to stay with my people and then the company I'm in now because I, I like them and they, they trust each other. He said, you know what the policy is? And I, I said, yes, sir. The policy was if you get a battlefield commission, go someplace else. A new unit. Yeah, a new unit. He says, well, he says, told the other, he says, send him back to his own unit. 
So, mm. so I, I went out went out to get my truck, you know, because my, my driver was out there. And uh, this guy came up to me and he says, uh, uh, are you, is that your truck or was this your truck there? I said, yeah. He said, somebody just stole it. I said, Christ, you baby, pay, make me a second of ten, then they steal my truck. And, uh, but they, they caught the guy. But you know, I went back, and uh, they were so used to calling me something else, you know, back there. And they saw the gold bar. And the country men knew about it, and uh, didn't tell me until I got there. But uh, I became a second lieutenant. And, uh, so you were a second lieutenant platoon leader. Right. Yeah, but I, uh, I, I never changed my way of doing things. And uh, I, I always do. I always stay pretty much on track with, with what I wanted to do. And it, I rarely changed my mind if I made something. And uh, but my men always came first. I and, bet. Uh, I had a, had one kid in there that was was giving me a bad time and behind my back and everything. And our company got cut off in the, in, in the past, and uh, we couldn't get out. They, uh, and uh, the regiment wanted prisoners, and we had some. You had prisoners? Yeah, we had captured some. And uh, he said, we've got to get him back. And I said, to him, well, he said, you take him back. I said, can I use your Jeep? He said, yeah. And I said, how are we going to get through the line? He says, that's your pr problem, not mine. I said, okay. And uh, I needed a driver. And the kid that was giving me a bad time is the one that volunteered. To be your driver? Be my driver. And I told him, I said, you know, the, we, we may not get through that thing. He said, well, he says, I, I guess we'll go together. And, but we we made it. And uh, I promoted him. And uh, he became a good friend. That's great. That's and, great. Uh, you know, it's, I, 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 like, the, I like that this, that way of living in, at that time. But uh, so you were basically were you still marching north? Yep, still with marching. The, with the objective of getting to we we had no really objective. We just was going to push them back. Just as pushing as we can. the North Koreans yeah. back. Get them, get them to go back across the river, and mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how successful the the operation was because I didn't stay there that much longer. I, I went home. So, so when did you, you recall about when you left? Yeah, I left in March to go home. March of? 51. 51. Yeah. I went home. <laughs> I, I, I stopped at uh, uh, Fort Lewis, Washington to get some clothes. And... Uh, then I got a, went home, and uh, then I was reassigned and, and to Fort Devens okay. again. Uh, Pat, before we continue, uh, I think you had thought of one further incident from Korea that you wanted to share with us. Can you uh, can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, I guess I I missed that one, but. Uh, we were dug in uh, on a rise, and not too high, but high enough so we could overlook the Nighttime River. And we knew that the, the uh, North Koreans were coming across, and uh, we didn't know quite a, how close they were until we, they opened fire. And, then, and uh, suddenly uh, I felt that God damn, they're right, right in front of me. I don't know how they got there, but they did. And uh, so we had a firefight, and uh, 
most of the evening, early evening, we had a firefight and, and uh, everything became quiet and I didn't sleep or anything. I just wait for the next one. They, they like coming. I found three of them in front of me and one guy had his hand on, on, my, on the edge of my hole. And uh, that, that made me very nervous. So they were part of this attack on coming right, right for you? Right, right for our unit. My company commander actually was about maybe 10 feet above me. And uh, he knew what was going on down below him, but he couldn't do anything because line of fire. And, but basically, uh, so you're, so were you in, in a foxhole? <clears throat> I had a, I had dug a lo little hole in there so I could get down below the, the ground level a little bit by squatting down. So I guess you won the firefight. <laughs> I guess I won the firefight. But at, at night, at night, when, when I go to get in my hole, I always put two hand grenades, one on each side of me, hmm? and, and I also put a knife in front of me, and uh, just in case uh, that happens again. And, uh, <coughs> so, well, that's that's quite a story. That's quite a story. Uh, well, and indeed, they were trying to kill you. Well, they tried to kill all of us and get as much. We did lose some people that way because uh, you can't get them all. You can't but, get them all. Uh, well, we got more more of them than they got of us. Right. And, right. Uh, but. Uh, well, that's that's a great that's quite a story. Thank you. Okay. So I think now going back, we you had returned to the states. I was uh, in Fort Devens. Back in Fort Devens. Um, yeah. Well. So, so what? The, and this was. So it, this was it, night, it, late fifty one. Right. And. Uh, we, uh, I guess, it was, yeah, it must be one, no. Late, late 51 or early 52. 51 or early 50, 40. I don't, I'm not sure about the date. But anyway, uh, I didn't like the assignment. In Devons? In Devons. What was it? The assignment was, there was the... People were getting a lot of uh, uh, undesirable, though, I guess you might want to call it, because Boston was very close, and uh, they're having a lot of trouble down Boston with people there. And uh, we had a unit on the base that had uh, uh, a whack attachment in it that had. That Four different units in that in that particular unit, and uh, they were always creating problems for everybody, and I didn't like that, and uh, I wanted to go back to a, a regular unit. Well, that regular unit came came on. A, so by this point, you had been separated from the Manchu, uh, from the Ninth Regiment. Oh yeah, I was no no more with them. Right. So you were in a different setting altogether. Altogether, I was reassigned in Devons. Okay. okay. To Devons. So, and, go ahead. I no, I just you oh. were going to tell us something was about to happen. And uh, my company clerk came in and he says, you know, there's a colonel on the base here recruiting. And I said, well, where? And he says, in the uh, theater. I said, well, I'll be right back. So I went down. And uh, I met this colonel. I just said hello to him. That's all I did. And uh, he started his, his speech. He had about maybe uh, 35, 40 people in there. Some of them were officers. And uh, he said he was organizing a, a new group and he needed people that uh, be dependable and so on and so forth. And uh, I told him who I was and what I had done. He says, uh, are you a paratrooper? And I said, no. I said, I can be a paratrooper real quick. And he says, you get your, 
You get your badge, you said you report back to me at Fort Devens, at, at Fort uh, Bragg. And uh, I said, that's fair enough. So who was this colonel, by the way? Colonel Banks, Aaron Banks. Banks. Bank. No. B-A-N-K-S. Yeah, Bank. Bank. And uh, so I went to jump school. Now, wait, just, I'm sorry. Go you, ahead. Were, were you still a second lieutenant? Yep. Second lieutenant. Was se se second lieutenant. And this was 1950. 1953. 53 or so. Yeah, probably was. Okay. Yeah, it had to be. Good. And uh, so you went to. No, it wasn't 53 either. It had to be 51 because. Oh, no. After Korea, right. Yeah, yeah. 51. Still 51. 51. Okay. Yeah, late, late 51. Anyway, I went there, went to jump school. And where was jump school? Fort Benning, Georgia. Fort Benning. That was the, that was the school. And uh, I made made the course good, and I loved it. And uh, so I got done, and I got my c certificate. And the next day I took a train up to Fort, up to, uh, Fort, Devin, uh, Fort uh, Bragg and uh, reported in up there. And I asked for orders to go there. You have to do that. And uh, I reported there, and and uh, the colonel was there in, in his office, and I went in and saw him. I says, "Here I am." I said, "You, you told me uh, I could come if uh, I got my wings." Uh, so I said, "I got them." How long did it take you to get your wings, by the way? We went to the jump school uh, well, thirty days, I guess. And uh, and basically, that was just. I mean, basically, did you just start jumping out of airplanes? Oh, no, 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 no. When you go through jump school, you have to go through uh, all the uh, things you have to know, you know how, how to land and uh, how to stay in the plane, how to cut out that plane, and, and uh, how to land and stuff like that. So and, you kind of built up. Yeah, and your biggest part of your training is is uh, PT, running. Oh. And then you ran around that damn airfield about, about four times a day, I guess. So you got in peak, even better condition. Yeah, and I uh, had a, and the colonel that ran the school, he says, regardless of what rank you are, if you're a private or a colonel or anything else, he says, my men tell you Sir, you made a mistake. You automatically give him 10 push-ups, regardless of where you are. So did you do a lot of push-ups? Oh, jeez. Uh, I think I pushed myself up all the way around. I had this little corporal, and um, he knew I was, used to be a, a sergeant major and stuff. He knew that, and, uh, but I knew that he had the authority to do what he's doing, or he wouldn't do it. But anyway, I got along good with him until we started running around. Now, I'll tell you that. He, he picked the damn platoon I was in to, to, to train us. And the first time around, he, we started running, he said, Sir, you made a mistake. That was, that, that, that did bother me. I get down and get 10 push up and start, and the, the, the people still continue down the road. I did the 10 push ups. He said, and, and I catch up with the platoon. And I ran like hell and got, got, got back in the platoon, and he was with me. And I guess in about three minutes, sir, you made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> he made mistakes all the way around that airfield. Every day. Did he not like you? No, he didn't. Uh, that wasn't it. He, he, I think it was, he was just, he did it to some, some other people too. I think he just got a kick out of it, and then and his buddies were doing the same thing, I guess. But it was, uh, one, physical condition, and two, Obeying a quick order. Right, right. You're going to be on an airplane. And uh, 
So I, I got my wings and uh, came back up and report to Colonel Banks. And uh, he welcomed me good and uh, he told me what he wanted me to do and I did it. The only problem I had with, with this, I was a second lieutenant and they were just starting to organize and most of the officers there were at least major and higher. So what were they organizing? Well, we had a, we had a, an open, uh, a, a, um, a um, orders out that anybody who wanted to join the group could come in and join it. Special forces. Mm -hmm. This was spe so. This was special forces you're talking about. Yeah, and uh, they were. Uh, uh, he's going. He's going to pick them himself. They really wanted for, for officers and enlisted men, and uh, so we were at uh, Fort, Bra so Fort Bragg, and. Uh, by the time we got done getting people coming in, we had almost a thousand damn people who wanted to be in special forces. So this was at the very beginning of the Be special forces. Very beginning. He was the, the, the colonel uh, had a hard time getting getting this thing to, approved for him, but he did it. And he himself was was a World War Two working behind the lines. And he was on the German general staff for a while, according to the records. So he knew what he was doing. And, but he, he ran up against a lot of West Pointers in West Point, in, in uh, Washington. Washington. And uh, they didn't like the fact that he was doing this. They, they want their own people to be coming to them, especially the infantry. He was really creating a special elite unit. Well, that's a correct, right? And he did, uh, but anyway. So you were among a thousand other people there. They were trying to stay with him. Trying to stay with him. Right, and uh, I must have headed off with him because he kept me, and uh, it was in uh, oh god, I would probably say. Towards the end of the year, he decided he was going to have have the teams made up now, and he did. And uh, he handpicked every team leader that he wanted. And uh, most of those team leaders were captains or higher. And, uh, and I was still a second lieutenant, but he gave me a team. Made and you a team leader? I was a team leader. And, uh, and uh, the Special Forces team, A team, is a, uh, an officer, an exe the, exe the executive officer, and 10 sergeants. And every sergeant is an expert in this field. Different experts. Oh, yes. We have heavy weapons, left weapons, medics, and everything. They're all uh, handpicked by, by us. And... Uh, the team leader can pick as people he wants, providing he had the uh, uh, the MOS is correct, and uh, so I was able to pick my men up, and uh, we train, and uh, as we train, we keep them or or drop them out, and, uh, because number one, the A team. And the Special Forces operates behind the lines. Behind enemy lines. Behind enemy lines, not in front. <clears throat> now, when he goes in with a team, he's already being contacted by the, the, uh, the, the uh, guerrilla teams back, back in that line, behind where you're going. And they've, they've been screened to, to make sure that we're, we're with the right people. And then the, the officer was given permission to do certain things that he would never do in, in the States. One, suppose one of my men uh, raped one of, the, one, of the, one of the girls in, 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 in behind the lines. Well, number one, if that happened, 
the, them other people that live there are, keep become very, very mean, you know, mm -hmm. and they would want to take care of him. And uh, but we had the authority ourselves to do what we had to do to discipline them. Discipline severely, maybe yeah, forever. But we, to my knowledge, we never had to do that because wow. the people we picked were very, uh, were straight. They knew. So, so you had a team, and finally you had the team that you wanted. Yeah. And then what did you do? Well, I had the, I had these, these two people, and then I had two two other people on the team that would. Uh, I trained myself in demolitions. Demolition, okay. But that, as far as they could go, they would not be allowed to go near a radio or near any kind of communications. They had to stay away. Why was that? Because we could only find out just enough to be trustworthy with them. But you never know when they, when they, the guy is is not what he's supposed to be. So were these foreign nationals or something? Or yeah, they... these are foreign nationals. Okay, I see. And then this senator from Massachusetts, I forget his name now, he's dead, passed a bill in Congress that if these people that you picked serve on a, on a special forces for five, five years, they would become American citizens automatically. Path to citizenship. And you know, that, that, that appealed to an awful lot of people. So we picked these people, and uh, to my knowledge, uh, every one of them that qualified got it. And uh, that's, these teams were, were very good. So you were still at Fort Bragg. You had a team assembled. Yep. What did you, what then? Well, we had ch training, and uh, I'll give you a little incident that happened. We used to, Colonel Banks didn't care how you dressed when we go in the field. You could dress any way you want. And uh, sometimes we would run as a unit on the main base. Well, we had a field general, the other major general, was base commander. He hated us with passion. And he refused to allow, allow us to wear the green beret. And, uh, but we get out in the field, we were, but not on the base. And uh, one day we had a President Kennedy come down to visit us. We have a demonstration area. It's one of the best in the world for what we got. And uh, we had everything in there. Demolition, I, I had, the, my station was demolitions. I would give a dem demolition. Demonstration of demolition. demolition. Oh yeah, people liked that. They liked the noise. <laughs> and uh, another one we, uh, was, was a box of snakes. And uh, that was good. I'll tell you a story about that one for maybe interested people. But anyway, uh, the Kennedy came through there, and, uh, and I was standing with the big, the, the, the base commander with the uh, Colonel Banks, and uh, he, he, wore, he had a, the line of sergeants out there, and the, and the Kennedy wanted to walk down and talk to him. Fine, he did, and he stopped in front of this sergeant. Sort of the, uh, I, I don't know how old he was, but he sure how looked at, like he was a hundred years old. But anyway, he stopped in front of him, and uh, the colonel said, "I don't know what the hell he's going to do with him." And uh, the sergeant was very outspoken, and so <coughs> Kennedy asked him what what he could do for him. He says. Authorize the green beret for us to wear. Wow. <laughs> I, thought, I thought the colonel was going to drop his hat. And, uh, 
<coughs> we all struggled, you know. And uh, he turned to his aide and said something to him, we, we don't know. But then he came back over to the colonel and he says, uh, you will have an order tomorrow to wear the Green Beret, period. Regardless of what the general thought. That's right. And we, by God, we put the Green Beret, it was all over the place, and our current, current base got a call from the post commander. And the uh, post commander told him, I mean, current bank's telling me, he says, Sir, if we got a letter, we'll send it right over to you. From Not the president? Where, where <laughs> that general, I guess, was fit to be tied. So this was, uh, so Kennedy was elected in 1960. Yeah. So now we're, so, so, so between the time you started in the Special Forces, when, when was that, when did you start the Special Forces? Like 1952. The late, so you were, so were you in Fort Bragg most of that time? I was. Okay, okay. And in six, so did you deploy at all during that time, or no. mostly in the in, at Fort Bragg? Just at Fort Bragg. So. No, I, I don't think he. I don't think Kennedy was that late. Oh, he may not have been a president then. He was president. Okay, then it's okay. So then, yeah. therefore, it was nineteen. He, he was president. Of the... Yeah, well, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he was elected anyway. in sixty. Uh, then we had a, had another incident that really shook Washington up. You know when the uh, the uh, federal government has this massive uh, uh, dinner uh, sometime during the year for all the people that are in business and everything. They, yes. they get a name for it. I forget what the name of it is, but it's a huge dinner. It's all top people in the country had to do that. Well, they wanted a special forces team up there to demonstrate. Well, For this meet, for this for din meeting. dinner. Yeah, no, to show the people what, what they sure. were paying for. And uh, this particular sergeant, the other one we were talking about, he, he liked to play with snakes and he... And, he uh, liked to play with snakes. Yeah, he did. And we had, we had a lot of them. And... Uh, uh, initially, uh, he had a, some uh, congressmen at Fort Bragg to, to look at the demonstration. And he had this sergeant with the snakes. And, and so the, it's one of these smarty guys, you know, got all the answers. <laughs> and he, he tried to make things tough for you. And uh, so he uh, asked the sergeant, he says, uh, you take care of all these things? He said, yeah. And we had some bad, bad snakes there, you know. Can you so, stop uh, just for a minute? Yeah. Sorry, I just want to let, let okay. sorry. And uh, so the so the civilian, I don't know who, they, who he was, he was a senator though. And they, they had all their wives with them. And uh, he says, suppose you're out in the jungle, he says, or in a swamp, he says, a snake egg or, or a snake come up to him and you want to kill him. He says, shoot him. Well, he went through that literally all the way through. So finally, he got to the point where the, uh, he had the patience of the, of the sergeant at, at a uh, very high temperature. And he said, uh, so he reached in the box, got got one, and pulled them out about that long, and uh, we were all standing there watching. Them. What the hell is he going to do now? And uh, so this senator says, uh, "You don't know what you were doing now, would you?" He said, "Yeah, I know what I would do with this guy." He says, "What are you going to do with him?" And he, and he bit his head off. I mean, right there. The women were screaming, and, the, and this, this center was up, up in arms and everything. I mean, he was r rigid. He bit the snake's head off. Yeah, bit his head off. And <laughs> Colonel Banks says, oh, my God. That's all he said, but nothing else. <laughs> and he's, uh, he said, that sergeant did the right thing, I guess. He said, but we're going to hear from it. 
Did well, that shut the senator up? No, he didn't do nothing. And uh, to my knowledge, he might have done something behind it. But anyway, that incident carried over to Washington when they had this big, big dinner. And uh, they brought the snakes up there and everything else. And uh, so the sergeant was there. He, was, he had the snake handler. I had the repelling. I was repelling off the building. And, well, that was your that was your part of the demonstration. My, my part of the demonstration, and uh, suddenly we heard a hell of a goddamn noise coming out of that building, and people were coming out the door, <laughs> and uh, so I came down. You know, I said, "Grab somebody." I said, what the hell's going on? He says, "You, your sergeant just bit the head off a snake, and and then and all these people were eating their dinner." <laughs> I thought, oh, Christ. And the <clears throat> next thing we, we got, military police and the, uh, other police running up all, all people who were special forces. And there were buses coming in real quick. And we were ordered to get on that bus, to go down to the depot, get on that train, and go back to your base, period. <laughs> Everybody, the special forces. The whole group? The whole group. Was it one team or a whole? Uh, oh, no, we had a demonstration team. We had about 30 people there. Okay, doing special, yeah. okay. But, Including the sergeant with the snakes? Oh, yeah. He took his snakes with him. But, uh, um, uh, uh, to this day, I wish I'd have been in there seeing what happened. Well, you but, must have seen it the first time, right? On the field with well, the Well, I've seen it on the field when he did it the first time. <laughs> uh, uh, it's not something I would like. <laughs> but, uh, but he was... That's how they got the reputation of snake eaters. Yeah. They have a, the special forces. Yeah, they yeah they 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 got a they got a book and a t and a and a uh, flyer out on it, and hmm. uh, they think we every snakes we well, we don't. But by the way, <clears throat> some snakes are good to eat. I, I I take your word for it. Uh, no, well, I take that word for it too, because I'm not going to do it. But uh, anyway, <laughs> that was uh, okay. So you so you got back from your demonstration. Uh, uh, we're we're around 1960, well, I guess, or yeah. something in that Six, neck. 61, I think. 61. So what? Uh, well, anyway, what what happened? We got the teams all lit, licked up, and we uh, put the other people that we didn't select for the 10th group. Tenth group was going to be the the key, the key one, and uh, later on, and the, the, they made another group after we got got done with the first. But the tenth group was alerted to go to Germany. Germany. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> this, this came out of the blue sky. Nobody expected it, and uh, we were we took. Five teams, I think it was. Uh, one one company with eight teams in it uh, to uh, Germany, and uh, we got on buses at the uh, at the fort. Went down to uh, South Carolina to, to the, the, the outport down there. Got on board a ship that was already waiting for us, and we took off, and uh, we landed at. Uh, uh, the Bremerhaven. Bremerhaven. They got on a train there down to Bad Tolts, and uh, that's when the all the Germans were out there watching us, and uh, they were. Then we had our our mission, and uh, what was your mission? Our mission was to. Uh, there was, one, two, or three, <coughs> three, four, three of those camps went there. We had one of those big camps. Displaced persons. Displaced persons were in it. Okay. But there, within that thing, there were hundreds and hundreds of people and families in it. There were certain people in there that were trying to uh, get a revolution going in Germany and uh, <coughs> get a record. That was sort of what we were told. Now, we picked out a, a, a an area where they, the team was not too far from our our office, 
<clears throat> and there was a ridge across there, and we would have a an alert once a month on that ridge, and we would put everything we had up there, weapons and everything, and uh, we, we didn't do nothing, we just sat there for a while, but then our so our people that we were, uh, what the hell they call it, the, 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 uh, the indigenous people. Yeah, the indigenous, the two indigenous people on each team. Yes. <clears throat> they would they dress up the way they would normally dress, anything. And they would infiltrate these big camps. And uh, <coughs> then they would find out who is, far, who is what, and then we would watch them. And then... And we would let them let the CID know the people you work for know that these people are coming out of the camp. They were going up the Audubon, and they they, got, they had a dead letter drop up there. And uh, we find out about it and because they led us to it, and then we come back, and uh, we would notify the, the, the their office. And uh, they would set a trap, and grab them, I, to capture these capture the troublemakers. The troublemakers, and uh, not not by you, but by oh, some no, other. Oh no, 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 no! We we had nothing to do with uh, picking them up. Got it. Got we, it. All we do is just find them, identify them, and uh, that, that would been been our job behind the lines to start with. So it was practice. And uh, but our digital people were, were very good at it, and uh, so how long did you do do this work, or how long were you there? Well, we we did it we did it for about a year and a half. Oh, and uh, then the camps broke up themselves, and they they become integrated in the regular population, and uh, so peace, peace came by. So by now it's uh, 1962 or three or something like that. Late fifties. What? Late fifties. Yeah, it could be. Oh, I'm sorry. I, okay, so this was actually before the Kennedy yes. uh, deal. Okay. Yeah. I but see. anyway. Okay. The uh, it worked out pretty good. I mean, it's, it's not classified or anything now. Now it used to be, but. Uh, I'm sure just about everything you did was yeah, highly classified. Yeah. Well, we were not allowed to go near the any border that the Russians had uh, uh, could get to. We were, we were we were just not allowed to go near the borders. I see. Uh, I think it was five miles, or something like that. But uh, it, it worked. So you had to stay away from the Russians for sure. Uh, or and they, at that time they didn't want uh, we couldn't go to Berlin for an example could not go to Berlin oh uh, we got we got people there now but we couldn't then right so uh, that's all of our, everybody's peaceful so you came back from that back to Fort Bragg yeah and uh, and I had other assignments in there then uh, I came home and uh, then I was reassigned back to uh, to another unit. Uh, Still special forces. Uh, no, it wasn't the special forces. Uh, it was a long range patrol to, uh, company. Where, uh, out of Fort Bragg? No, they were out of, uh, uh, I can't think of the name of the place, it was out of Stuttgart, Germany. Oh, where, Germany. Where we were. And there was a long range patrol company for uh, 7th Corps. And their job, and our job on that one, whoops, oh, thank you. Our job on that one was to, uh, we had teams also on that, and uh, our teams on there were only five people to a team. But this was not Special Forces? No. Okay. It was long range. The, the only company they had in Europe, and uh, I was with that, and uh, that was for... If and when we dropped uh, atom bombs or something, mm. uh, we would, if we knew when to, where to go, then we would drop our 
uh, one or two teams in there. And uh, those teams were, would, would develop uh, an, a, uh, oh, what the hell is the word I want to use? Well, they would report back what the damage was and, and where it was. From the uh, explosion, from the from atomic the, bomb. Yeah, but they wouldn't be near it. They'd right. be away from it. But of course, they could see huh. it. And uh, but they were they were trained to take care of themselves. But uh, as it turned out, uh, uh, it never happened. So, but they still got the teams. But I that guess. was a very hot topic at that time. It, it was for sure. Yeah, you know, we you you would have to parachute in. So, so everybody was a paratrooper. Yeah. Everybody was a paratrooper. Then, and by the way, I understand uh, you did a lot of uh, parachute jumps uh, over your career, right? You you received a master master parachutes. So uh, what? And what's that for? For uh, a certain number of. Well, no, you can wear uh, uh, the the regular parachute badge. You get as many jumps as you want. But uh, if you want to be a, a master parachutist or something like that, there, there's a, a criteria you got to meet first. And what was that? Uh, well, one, you have the night jump. And then you have your uh, your uh, uh, parachute pack jumps. They, 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 they go from anywhere from 50 to 100 pounds. And uh, those, those are tricky because they help you stand in the door of the plane. I got pictures of it downstairs, uh, some of it. That you would stand in the uh, door and uh, they would help you get, get to the door because if you had a, the big one and uh, you have a 50 foot rope on it on, uh, tied to you and tied to that. But when you parachute, that pack is tied to you. So when you jump, you, you, your parachute open up, then you pull the, the two snaps here, and that parachute will, I mean, uh, that bag will drop down between your legs, about maybe 35 to 50 feet. Hmm. Now the purpose of that is, if you try to land with that, you're gonna break your back. Oh, I, okay. So you can't do that. You have that and you snap that and make damn sure it's done. You have a knife on it if it's because of uh, something that's malfunctioning, just cut it loose. And uh, when that lands, uh, you're right behind it. So you have your equipment with you. Have all your equipment. All your equipment, quite a bit. Right. And uh, so anyway, you were a master parachutist. Right. And uh, at at some point here, you went to Vietnam, right? Is that, or are we? Yeah. Uh, am I getting close? Yeah. To no. The... Uh, we have a. Excuse me. Uh, a master parachutist is, is one, and the other is a jump master. I was both. You were both a master parachutist and a jump master. Right. Which means you control the jump? I control the, I control the jump on the plane. And uh, when we're get, getting ready to have a... Uh, huh. Put your hand down. Huh? Put your hand down. Oh. Uh, you have a, your plane loaded. With the mastiff, now you have the your, your roster. Now, say for an example, you were on the plane with me, part of the plane, and you decided not to jump, or maybe you don't show up mm -hmm. for when you're on that mat, when you're on that roster. If you don't show up to, to go to the jump area. Uh, 
they can do anything, just about anything you want. Most of the time, they'll they'll throw you out of out of the, uh, out of jump pay for it. And they won't, you can't get paid for it anymore. So, and uh, it happens. It happened right. to right. a friend of mine, and and uh, he was very nice, but he, he decided he wasn't going to jump it anymore. Didn't want to do it anymore. No. Oh. So he, he, went, he, was a, he was a lieutenant colonel to boot. And, uh, but so, so, but then you got back into the Special Forces after yeah. this long range. Right. Uh, so I got back in and uh, they assigned me, they assigned me to the 5th Special Forces Group. 5th? Right. They were in uh, Vietnam. Oh, so we were in Vietnam now. Yeah, but I was in the fifth in the states when we went there, and uh, we uh, got on a plane to go to Vietnam, and uh, we were not allowed to go into Japan into uh, Vietnam with the uniform on. Not allowed. Not allowed. And, well, uh, this was early, right? Yeah, it was 1960 something, 63. 62 or 63? 63, yeah. yeah. Not authorized by Congress. So everything was under highly the... classified and under cover. Okay. And so we, we would go into uh, Vietnam and the, their big airport, uh, which is very, very busy. And our plane would land and just go up to down to the end of the runway into another hut, and we were good to get out, and uh, then the plane would leave, and they would bring helicopters in. To pick you up? To pick us up and take us to our base camp, which is north of the, uh, the, the city, quite a ways. Is the city Saigon? Is yeah. Okay. And uh, they would uh, then sign us to our Targets. Our target, the one I had, was in, in the Delta. And what, what, what do you mean target, or what? what well, the objective? we had our our base camp there, and then we had uh, our other camps along the border with uh, Thailand. Okay. And we controlled those. I had a B team then. We would control the uh, those camps, make sure that they. they or had everything they needed. The and camps it, of what? Uh, our our the, camps. Your the special forces camps. Oh yeah. And you were still a second lieutenant. No 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 no. I was a uh, sergeant major then. And uh, I, because after after I made my captain, and before I got my degrees, uh, they were uh, cutting the army officers back. And if you didn't have a degree, there was a reduction in force. Okay, yeah, reduction I, I, in I force. Guess. In any event, you were a senior, a very senior sergeant major person. That's the that's yeah. the highest, right? Right. Yes, it is. But uh, it was. Uh, uh, I understood that what they were doing, so it was no problem. But right now, I said, "Then they never do that to me again." <laughs> now I'm a master. Uh, I have a master's. Yeah, the BS and, and the, the BS. BS. Right. 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 Yeah. So, so anyway, you were a sergeant major. So you were in, were you a team in, in charge yeah, of a team? Right? I had a B team, a B team in in, uh, in, in in Vietnam, and then so were there. So at that point, was the U.S. presence really special forces only? In other words, regular troops weren't there yet. Oh no, the regular, nobody was there. That's why we were in civilian clothes. It was all hush hush. That's right, and uh, nobody. Nobody paid any attention to us because there was thousands of civilians running around. So, were you encountering the Viet Cong, for instance, or, or the, I mean, the enemy in some? Yeah, we did. They hit our camp a couple times, you know, where we were, and, but we had a, a circle, and we had a, our, our mortars right in the middle of the camp, and, and on each corner, we had like a little fort, like. But our camp was pretty good size, right? And uh, 
in, the, in each one of those corners, you had all kinds of weapons and stuff like that. Right. So you could never run out of ammunition. So did did various teams and whatnot go out from the camp? No. Oh, well, you yeah. stayed in the camp. They, they stayed in the camp because in our camp now, because they were uh, we were going to these other camps by helicopter to take wow. them. But now the little teams we had out there were were generally A teams, and uh, they uh, they stayed in the camp all the time. Okay. Okay. But they were up close to the enemy. So Although they were didn't make much difference because they would hit us too. So. And the enemy in this case was the Viet Cong. Right. And you, so that's what you did there. Did you parachute? Were you parachuting? Well, I had a, a, we didn't have to parachute too much, but we had a mission one time. And uh, the Vietnamese had special forces too, but not like ours, but they had their own. And they had three teams. Uh, for a, a jump, and uh, when they they used our, one of our airplanes and our pilots, and I guess they had a policy that when they they go on a mission, to be Americans with them. And so uh, I was uh, went with two of my men and myself with them. And, we, and they had a big ceremony in the air, on the airstrip. They had all these, all the brass. And uh, we were sort of uh, hidden behind something that we weren't part of it, really. I, okay, so you were, the the attention was on the South Vietnamese. That's right. Not, not on... No, 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 we were just going along. But uh, we were experts and they weren't. But you were like advisors as opposed to... More or less. Okay. And uh, we took off <clears throat> and uh, and we were flying over the target area uh, at about 2,500 feet. 2,500? Yeah. We were just flying over. And this was a plane, not a hell. No, a plane yep. with, with the Vietnamese on it. And uh, so I was standing in the door of the, of the plane going over, and I noticed on the ground there was a lot of smoke. And so, so I, I told the pilot, I asked him to make another run a bit lower and see what was happening. And we did. And uh, we were then kind of. Uh, maybe another few hundred feet, and then we made another round, a second one. And uh, I, on the second one, we, I wanted to go to, down to 800 feet, because 800 feet you can jump, you parachute open, and you're on the ground. So you wanted to make make it as quick as possible. That's right, so be, because the, the, uh, the, these fires are campfires for the indigenous. And uh, so uh, the, their teams would be right on top of them. And uh, everything worked out fine, except we got a wind that came up all of a sudden. And uh, just about the time we were going, <coughs> and uh, the colonel for the Vietnamese uh, wanted the Americans to go first, not them. And I said, fine. So. I went first, and my other two soldiers went with me. And uh, unfortunately, the wind caught me, and I, I tried to steer it with with me. And uh, there was a, I guess, a temple down below me. So you can basically steer a parachute a little bit. Yeah, you can you can steer a parachute as long as the wind is with you, or or get even against you. You can steer it. Uh, most of the time, sometimes you can't. But I was trying to do that, and I, I could see I, I wasn't going to make it. So I didn't want my face or a head to hit that damn building. So I put this arm out and this leg out. Oh, so, as you were hit, approaching the building. And it was a part like that over there. 
I knew I was going to hit it. And I figured it would be better to hit my side instead of my face. And I did. And uh, I hit the turn, I hit the side of the building about three stories up. It fell down and landed in a, in a puddle of mud. And so at least I was had a soft landing, but it hurt like hell. And then I couldn't move. And uh, they, they radio for a helicopter to come and get me. And uh, the other guys, I guess they kept on on going. They didn't jump at all, except my people. And, the South Vietnamese? Uh, no, they, they saw what was happening. And uh, for some reason, they took off. And didn't jump. And, so it was uh, you and a few uh, Americans yeah, on the, the ground. Two, yeah, but they picked us up. And they took me back to Saigon and uh, landed me temporarily in a helicopter. It did something to me. I don't know what it was because I was had a lot of pain. Then they flew me back to my our home base, which is way up in uh, Vietnam, and uh, put me in a hospital. And uh, x rayed and then a uh, little nurse, she must have been about 35 years old, I guess. And she said, she had a little needle like that. She said, you ever have one of these in you? I said, no. Nope. She says, count 10 backwards. And she hit me right here. I said, 10, and that was all, all I knew. <laughs> and uh, I was gone. And uh, then I woke up, or I guess it was about midnight or something. It was late, the nurse sat in the bed, by the bed, and uh, she had a glass of water. When, uh, when I woke up, I tried to get up, and I couldn't, because this whole side was in a cast. I got a picture of that one. You've seen it? Right. Yeah, we'll, I've seen it. We'll, yeah. we'll get it later for the record here. Yeah. And anyway, they, uh, I laid there, and... Uh, and Edith knew nothing about it until somebody told her that I was hurt. And, uh, you know, there's, there's people who like to see you give you bad news. And we had some of them people back at Fort Bragg that they'd like to get bad news. And they upset her. And so I could come in a... In a uh, in the surgical ward, and when they got done with me, uh, they put me on an airplane, and um, uh, it was a regular uh, airplane for a, uh, for people who were like myself who were, who were broken up, and uh, they had nurses and everything on it. And uh, I landed in California. Mm -hmm. I landed in Hawaii first. They had a good fuel, I guess, and then they landed me at California, and uh, they put me in the hospital there overnight. And the doctor said, well, we're going to send you to Walter Reed. And uh, I said, Walter Reed? I said, who the hell said, said that? I said, I'm at Fort Bragg. Well, whoever did it, did it from Fort Bragg. And uh, I said, okay. I said, then you knew about it, and then the, the doctor came back in later on. He says, you know, he says, you, you got a wife here at Fort Bragg? I said, yes, I do. He says, she's raising hell with some general there. And I said, that sounds like her. And uh, she, she got the, the assignment changed from Walter Reed back to Fort Bragg, so I'd be at home. And Sounds like you had a lot of pull. <laughs> no, I just, I, I ran out of patients and I, I told him I wanted him where I could take care of him. Good, good. So you went back, so you were diverted to Fort Bragg. Or yeah. did you, you never got to Walter Reed? No, I never got to Walter oh, Reed. Got, okay. So, and so I got there and, and uh, I uh, recuperated and, and uh, got, got back on my feet a little bit and... Uh, so, uh, but you had been badly injured. Oh, I mean, yeah. your your whole left side. Yeah, this is all in the cast for a long time, 
And uh, when I did get back on my feet a little bit, uh, I couldn't jump anymore. So that was out. And uh, so, so the colonel that was running the show there, he says, Patty, so you can stay here as long as you want. You don't have to jump. And I said, well, I says, these are people I know, and I said, oh, I can't do that. This was Colonel Colonel Bank? No. No, some no, other, another. Another Colonel. Yeah. And he's a good friend. He said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I guess I get another assignment. So he gave me a, sign, a, 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 a authority to go to the Pentagon, talk to those people. So I went to the Ben up there, and uh, I, I got the... Uh, General Bowles. Oh. Sitting there. And uh, so uh, I asked him for assignment. He gave me one, a choice of one. He was with me, three, three of them. And I, had, I could have one of them for ROTC. Oh, ROTC yeah. uh, <coughs> training officers in college, right? right? And so I, I accepted the uh, University of Illinois. But before that, after we got done with that, he said, well, uh, we're going to launch now. And uh, well, they work on it. And uh, so we went in the launch. And uh, now, I'm a sergeant major, you know. And uh, I walked in with him. <coughs> and then I said, Jesus, I said, I said, sir, I said, these are all generals. I said, what am I doing here? He says, you're with me. If, if, if they don't feed you, they don't feed me. And they got, there must have been 50 goddamn generals in that place eating dinner. Just, and, for, and, ge just for generals. And one sergeant major. One sergeant major. And uh, Good for General Bowles. Yeah. But uh, I got my assignment to the University of Illinois, and hmm. I retired. So you... You you went there and you taught students in ROTC. Yeah, I bet you did a great job with yeah. them. Well, I got some good good uh, uh, letters from the people that ran the place. As a matter of fact, we graduated both from it, from except except Edith got got in the the hall. That mm -hmm. one well, yeah, she got all the honors and I didn't. I so you went so you. Went into co went to college. Yep. At the yeah. University of Illinois after yeah. after ROTC. No, I was with ROT and I went to college at the same time. I see. Yeah. What did you study? Well, I can't say I studied much, but I, I passed everything. <laughs> <laughs> history. What well, uh, your history you, you, was my, you majored in history. Yeah, I like that. Cool. Well, I started with something else, sociology, but the, the professor I had told me. And he, he was there. He says, "You're not going to make it very far in my class with this." With this, he says, "He says, your wife is way ahead of you on this." I said, "Well, thank you." I changed and got history. I said, "The hell with that. I like history anyway." I see. So, so you stayed and got your degree. Yeah, I got my degree there, and I got my master's here. So, so. When you finished ROTC, that was your final assignment? That was my final assignment. We retired from there. And that was in what year? December 1969. She got that one down. December 1969. And yeah. then you did you stay a little while longer to complete your degree? No. Oh, you, you completed well, I, your degree. I, 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 I completed the degree. Got he, it. he already had quite a few credits. He had from uh, NC State uh, ever since that change happened to him. He pursued his education. I, I got it. So okay. he, he had enough credit. So by 1969, he was a graduate of the University of Illinois and uh, got a job at space utilization. So uh, he worked at space utilization while I finished my doctoral degree. And I got that one in 71. Okay, okay. so when, when did you finally get to Massachusetts? 73. 73. Oh, and you've been here ever, ever since. since. Yeah. Now, a little story goes by, I'd like to tell you about when I, when they, they, they changed the, uh, the 
the, the enlisted ranks up a little bit, and they up the, up the a little a little higher, and uh, so it's about E nine, and uh, which is top, you, very hard to get, and uh, so I had to go before a board, but before I went before there were about four or five other guys that went before me, and. Uh, the the guy that went ahead of me, uh, he went to before this board. Now this board had five people on it, and these five people were all West Pointers. And this uh, was a board to select E nines. Yeah, no, there was just one, and uh, these guys all uh, all ranked me in, in service all over the place, and. Uh, this one guy went in and they, he asked him a, they asked him a question. He says, uh, uh, no, I'm not, I don't need no more study. I got enough. Well, I, you don't say that to West Point is. And uh, so I went in. They knew me because the job I had was top secret. And the job I had when we were going out in the field for maneuvers, I re reverted to the general's tent for uh, uh, map work and stuff. So they all knew me. So I went in, and I guess I was in there maybe 10 minutes. Most of these guys have been there about almost an hour. I was in there about 10 minutes. And uh, they said, thank you. And then I walked out, and they gave, gave it to me. And, they uh, gave you the E9. Yeah, because I told them I was still working on my uh, uh, de de degrees, and they liked that, and they knew they knew my work in the in the in the uh, in the uh, core headquarters, so uh, it was good, and uh, I enjoyed it. And uh, so at that point, so E9 is that master that, sort? No, sergeant major. Sergeant major. I, I beg your pardon. That's the top. That's sergeant that's major. Top. Yep. Great! And wow. I'll show you a picture of it downstairs. Right. And uh, it was a uh, quite a time we had, and, and uh, actually, this is the end of end of it, I think. Uh, yeah. Did 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 you? Uh, so you you came here, and did you did did you continue with any you know v veterans organizations or? That sort of thing. Were you, were you a member of a veterans group? Oh yeah, uh, I had. Uh, I was uh, the chief of the town celebration committee. Town celebration committee yeah, for fifteen years, and that's that was a uh, thing to be be worthy of. And you were also in the Lexington Vet Veterans Association, yeah. right? Well, he he founded the. I found. He founded the group or co-founded it with Bill Stern, Stern. And, and, and a couple of others. The, the group that is currently doing a lot of activities and having events, he co-founded it. And that was yeah, it. Yeah. That was in the like in the mid mid seventies. Yes, yeah. from from about seventy three yeah. on. Basically, I was took it. Now, now Linda's got it. Yeah, Linda is running it now. Right. No. Right. And then uh, he yeah. also was a veteran services officer for quite a few years. Yeah. The first one in Lexington. Basically helping veterans with their benefits and right. other things. Right. Also, uh, I got the tricorn hat. That the white tricorn hat of Lexington, the right, top, right. Uh, top honor. honor for... The top uh, honor in Lexington. So you've done it all, just about. Hey, do you ever, have you ever, retent, have you ever attended any reunions of your old... Like the Manchus? I or? have, a, a Special Forces I have. You have? Yeah, but uh, right now they're, they're, they're so far away that uh, I, I can't make them anyway. Right. But, but you... you, I've, you I've, I've done it. We did. Right. Yeah. No, uh, uh, I organized the... Uh, uh, the National Battlefield... Order. Uh, National Order of Battlefield Commission. Yeah, I ordered, organized that. National Order of Battlefield, Battlefield Commission. Commissions. I got it. I got it downstairs. I can show you. Those are the Mustangs. 
So this was a group that you got organized. Is that yeah. what you said? I, I started it, and uh, and uh, I was president for three three years. Two, two terms. Two terms. Two terms. Was it two? No, three. Three. Yeah. yeah. I had three terms. Generally, one term is enough, but they kept putting me in, and I said, "Enough is enough." It sounds like you were willing to volunteer for lots of things. You did. Well, lots of things that I think that I like, and. Uh, so you have a question. I have a question for sure. you. Sure. Do you happen to remember your service number? Mine. All right. Oh God. I I just wondered. I had it. That, that, and that's okay. I, I have I just, his dog tag. You have his dog tag. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't we... Uh... Oh, I also organized another one that, that I like very much. Uh, is, it, is this on? Okay. Uh, was uh, the uh, honor... Uh, what the hell that that thing I, I I fixed it for the students that was a you mean the stone in, in, uh, at the uh, national Arlington National Cemetery no 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 mm -hmm. uh, I got that too but I, I'm I'm tired about the uh, you you the award I made for the kids oh yes the Lexington Youth Award I made a Lexington Youth Award. He started it. Committee. I started that. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's great. It was part of the way it happened because I was out in the yard, and, uh, and I, I knew I knew these police, well, I said police pretty well, and, but they pulled in, the, pulled in the yard one time we were talking, and they said, uh, you want to do something for the kids here? I says, well, what are you talking about? He says, well... The bad kids make the newspaper. He said the good kids don't ever. And uh, well, we chatted, and when, when we get all done, I, I thought about it, and uh, I went to work on it. And uh, I needed a committee, and the committee I got was all the top people in Lexington business. They wanted to sit on it, mm. and. Uh, I, so now we came up with a with a pen, and now on um, Patriots, uh, Patriots Day, that they, they award the kid who's the outstanding student. And that was all your. Uh, yeah, I, I started it. You started it. And uh, uh, it sunrise, was sunrise parade. That's when the kids get the award. That's wonderful. It, 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 I was amazed at what some of these kids do, and uh, my. The uh, how the how most of them that I talked to or got the paperwork on were kids that would they they liked their parents. Uh, the uh, Asian kids uh, that that were that were coming in, they uh, were very heavy towards their parents, especially with the, in the arts. And uh, we didn't have any, hardly any black kids doing it at the time, but we did have, well, they, they started coming in when they found out about it because they lived in Boston. The Metro. The Metro. And they were right, and, and, and uh, I, I figured they should be part of it too, they're going to school. And uh, we got, I got one one kid uh, down there, and uh, he had a fantastic one, and he got got a medal, and he went to uh, California to play football. Yeah. Mm. And uh, Caltech. And it's still going. So I have your dog tag. Uh, would you mind if I read your service number? Is that no, okay? No, go ahead. Or, or do you? Go ahead. No, All you, right. can, you can put it down. So. Not that easy to read. Okay, RA3128789. Sounds right. I think it is right. So, Pat, as we near the, uh, as we near the end of, we're about done with the interview, okay. uh, do you have any kind of summary thoughts 
from your time in the service, your distinguished service in three wards. Uh, anything you'd like to share with us that, you know, kind of some final thoughts from you about what it was like and what you took away well, from your service? I thought, uh, I thought my life, the way it unfolded for me, was meant to be. Uh, I've told my wife several times that I don't know how the heck I got to be 94 right now. People shooting at you and, and everything else. And I, but I wouldn't give it up for nothing. What I did, uh, most of the time I did because I wanted to. Uh, uh, I did it and because I thought it had to be done. And uh, I like people. And uh, in, in the military, uh, I, I never had any problems with the military, ever, because I followed the, their uh, mission, I followed their uh, attitude, and uh, I just liked it. And uh, would I do it again? I'm not sure I'd, I'd go, go to war again, but... Uh, yeah. Well, I think you've done uh, much, much more than your in your part. Uh, to mm -hmm. say I call it a distinguished career is a great understatement. Mm -hmm. It's the best. Oh, by the way, one of the things, we are just about out of time, but w would you mind if I read your awards? No. All right. Two bronze stars, one presidential badge for the invasion of Anzio, the Battle of Caves, five Purple Hearts, eight Major Battle Stars, two Army Commendation Medals, and Oak Leafs for two invasions, Anzio and St. Maxime, three Combat Infantry Badges, and a Master Paratroop Badge. Right. That's a career. I have no problem with that. Pat Flynn, thank you. Uh, my pleasure. Great interview.